everybody and welcome. I have the privilege of uh, calling our May 18th Bishop Unified School District School Board meeting to order. Thank you all so much for joining us. You can see it's a very, very large group. I know there's a lot of um, diversity of our opinions in this room tonight. And the fact that we can all be sitting here together like this, about to engage in conversation about what, what's best for our kids, that's truly a testament to the strength of our community, our neighbors, our friendships, and our relationships. So thank you all so much for being here tonight. We look forward to hearing all of your, as many as possible, of your perspectives, your opinions, and your thoughts on our agenda this evening. First, item 2.0, our flag salute. Mr. Nicholson, if you could lead us in our flag salute. Thank you. Please move your hats. Okay. Ready? Begin. Item 3.0, adoption of the May 18th, 2023 agenda. Do I have a motion to adopt item 3.0? I move to adopt item 3.0. Terrific. Do I have a second? I will second to adopt the agenda. All in favor of adopting the agenda for this evening, item 3.0. All in favor? Aye. 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 Go first. Sweet. Thank you. Thanks. All taken care of. Is there a microphone so, so we can hear you? Or? Yeah, hear you. There is no microphone this evening. Oh. Or do we have our speakers hooked up for there for there to send, not to receive? Yep. We'll do our best to we'll do our best to project our voices. Thank you for joining us. So, item 3.0. Let's do that vote one more time. All in favor of the adoption of the May 18th agenda, say aye. 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 All opposed. Item carries 5-0. Item 4.0, student reports and presentations. Item 4.1, our ASB presence report. Kate Anderson, thank you so much for joining us tonight. be rolling towards the closure at the end of the year, right? Any questions for uh, our ASB representative? Okay. 
Thank you very much. <coughs> and item 4.2, BUSD Student Senate Report, Georgia Gastelum. at your budget you've invited a much larger group than you usually do so they might be there for that free pizza but you just let us know any questions or um, comments for Georgia I don't know if it, I know I've seen the flyers but do you know are there any middle schoolers that are interested in student senate um, I do I don't believe that we've gotten any applications so far we may what happened last year is we didn't get a huge response from the eighth graders and so we just continued the applications for them for the freshman class beginning of next school year for an ongoing freshman position. Anything else? Terrific. Thank you. Of course, thank you so much. We're gonna go ahead and split up item 9.1, which is the AVID presentation, because we have two different groups of students who are here. So if I could ask uh, Lawrence Blocker, our, HMS, our HSMS AVID coordinator, to come forward with a couple of his AVID students to present to us. And the podium right there, that would be best, yep. Welcome. Hey there. <laughs> Good evening, it is great to see so much excitement uh, for our trip recap. Thank you everyone for coming. <laughs> So uh, I had the enviable task of taking 14 uh, middle school, eighth grade students. Uh, we went on an overnight trip up to Reno, and we got to visit uh, Truckee Meadows Community College. We got to visit two of their campuses, and we got to visit UNR as well. We got a, almost a full walking tour of that whole campus. And I have two of my students here, uh, here to share their uh, recollections and um, kind of how it's open their eyes a little bit to what the world looked like. So first we're gonna have Aubrey Frechette. <laughs> you got it, you got it. <sighs> okay, so I will be talking about basically my experience with the UNR trip and everything we technically did up there. And so I'm gonna bring up our, um, one minute. So our Edison campus that we visit was a part of Truckee Meadows Community College, which showed the mechanic, the auto, there was, there was a very big technology group. There was diesel and HVSC. HVSC. Yeah. Um, so practically at this, at this community college, they basically showed you how they like built and repaired cars. They showed how they ran and fixed up robots, how they fixed in how to like work on air conditioning. I'm, pr I'm pretty sure, yeah. Um, <laughs> they also showed us the engine of a, um, a semi truck, I'm pretty sure, how it works. And um, 
I thought it was really cool how it just just how it ran and how it could only go to a certain amount of like RPM and then eventually stop and then you can just press a button and it completely just shut off so I, th I thought that was honestly really cool <laughs> but yeah that was kind of like just what we viewed in our eyes of the um, like the mechanics part of the Truckee Meadows Community College um, hi everyone, I'm Anahi Flores and I'm an 8th grader at HSMS and today I will be talking about our experience at Truckee Meadows Community College. Truckee Meadows was a very educational camp, it had a fantastic gym and it was really outdoorsy kind of and I feel like they really wanted to incorporate every single thing that each kid wanted to do no matter what career they had so technically for each building they had your own career center that you wanted to do so they had medical engineering physiology and many more that people might or students might want to take as they go into college <laughs> okay um, they had a lot of diversity in what they teach and how they taught it so if anyone wanted to do like technology they had VR head VR headsets and a virtual reality car machine game, which kids could build on their own, or kids can even make their own games. If people wanted to do some type of medical or dentist industry, they had their own like dental and they had like fake patients and just like let them like breeze through how their career would go if they want to achieve it. And they basically, they had a lot and a lot of opportunities that kids can take. And it was honestly, for a community college, it was probably one of the best colleges that there was. And that was basically it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we had a, a fantastic trip. It's just, it's really cool to show these guys at 13, 14 years old, uh, you know, what possibilities there are for them out there. Uh, some of them have never left Bishop. And so, you know, the mall, it's still pretty popular. They really wanted to go to the mall. And so that was like a big thing for them. Um, and so, yeah, and the UNR campus, it was, it was just amazing. A five-story library, 20,000 students. I mean, their eyes were just like, what? It, was, it just blew them away. It was really cool to see. And um, yeah, it's a really tight-knit group. And I really enjoyed it. I want to thank uh, Jocelyn Hernandez. She was my uh, chaperone on this trip. And uh, yes, give it up for Jocelyn. And then also the Inyo County Office of Education, they paid for our hotel rooms. So thankful for them. Right. Any questions from the board? Do we have any questions for our students or for LB? What was the favorite part? Ooh. Okay. <laughs> okay. My favorite part was probably the UNR gym. I loved how like how much opportunities was in just that one big enclosure. I've never seen so much equipment in one building. <laughs> I'm just being honest. I I would my favorite part personally cuz I do play softball and I am I love like outdoor. I, I do a bunch of things outdoor dooring doors. <laughs> so, sorry. Um but they had I think the gym was in there. No no <laughs> Obviously, the gym. It's like there was a basketball court. There was indoor track. Indoor track. Oh yeah, that was around the basketball court. We only got to see the first floor, though. I'm pretty sure the four or five. It was a four or five story building. <laughs> but I, when L LB said, "Oh, you guys are gonna love the gym," that was my favorite part. When I walked in there, he was completely right about that. So yeah, so that was. Probably my favorite part of the trip. Yeah. Um, my favorite part of everything was probably the medical center that they had. Mm. I want to become a pediatrician, sur pediatrician surgeon. So just seeing Woo! that, <laughs> that <laughs> all the 
all of the type of medical stuff they had, all the equipment just from that college in one could really push students into what they really wanted to do and how it works before they go into any being an intern or before they start going to medical school. It could just basically just fly them through the ropes of the basics and how they would already know how to do it and it would just make their life so much easier. <laughs> and yeah. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead, Josh. Uh, what, what perspective of yours or position in life has changed from the beginning of AVID till now? Oh, okay. The entire package of AVID this year. So for me personally, definitely my, like, my speech, like the, what is, in front of, like, in front of a lot of people when you talk, like, have a pr presentation. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Sorry. <laughs> a lot of people here. <laughs> Um, but it really worked on like when people say in a sentence, um, like with our presentations and everything we do in front of the class, that really showed how much information we can put in and just throw out there without like stuttering, especially not really tonight, but <laughs> in class for sure. I, that is one of the biggest things I've realized since AVID. It's not only come in handy in AVID, but de definitely English and science and just every other class that comes with speaking. It definitely helped with that. So. I think what's impacted me the most was also the, the kids there. Because when you walk into a class of like stranger of kids you've been with for about 13 years, and some you don't like, some you do, <laughs> but as soon as you really see how they are inside, you realize that they're not that bad. And <laughs> being an avid, it kind of makes you like a family. You all really support each other, whether it'll be like for math. Like, if you have any trouble, you ask any one of them, and those kids will help you out. They really will. They're, like, <laughs> they really just, that's the word. Sports. Yeah, they're a good sport. They really are. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else? Also, you have a lot of fun in there. Like, it, may, it is a really important class to take. But also, there's days where you just feel like, I want to be with my friends, and those kids are your friends and family, so they help you throughout any problems you have, whether it's personal, even physical, you just talk to them about it. And you go about your day just thinking how one of your classmates helped you with a lot of your problems and knowing that you like hated them like a month ago, <laughs> but now you like love them to death. <laughs> And yeah, it's really impacting me how those people have affected my life in the future and the past and how they have just been there for me. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you all. Well done, girls. Really well done. Clear, clearly, it's working on the public speaking, right? They just they give it a round of applause. They did a terrific job. And to our students up front here, also, if you want to stay with us for the rest of the discussion, of course, you're always welcome. But if you need to duck out and get to your end of the year activities, we certainly understand that as well. Thanks so much for joining us tonight and for your presentations. Item 5.0 recognition. The board likes to take this time each month to recognize and say thank you to those among our student body, community, and staff who have gone the extra mile for our students and or the, school in our, the schools in our district. Item 5.1, thank yous for your years of service. And these are our retirees. Rachel Baldwin, Cheryl O'Brien, Nicole Barron, Delfina Trotter, Lourdes Solario, Jose Rojas, Alex Greenland, Angela Scott, Cindy De La Mora, Shelly Doherty, and William Doherty as well. Let's give them a round of applause. As well, item 5.2, we'd like to offer our congratulations to the BUSD 2023 Educators of the Year. For our classified staff, that's Josie Rogers and Chris Riggins, 
give them a round of applause. <laughs> and for our certificated staff, Kathleen Stout and Jennifer Hargrove. recognitions they'd like to make? Uh, yes, I have the privilege of attending the high school band concert. Uh, I think that was maybe even just last night at the court. It was fabulous. It was wonderful. I'm so impressed what Mr. Mills has been able to do with those kids. And then um, I had the joy of going to the fourth grade wax museum. That was so much fun. Oh, that was great. The kids all dressed up as their, some of their favorite historical figures. Thank you. Thank you. And then I've got one ad as well. It was mentioned in the high school principal report, but that's to Annette Holland, giving her and her team an entire shout out for their fashion show that they did last week with all of her fashion students showing off all their outfits. But what really struck me was her ability to speak personally about each of them and really identify their investment in the work they do as each of those students was called out, it was great to see them in the work, but the way she was able to celebrate each of them was really noteworthy. So a big thank you to Annette Holland. <laughs> and then last but not least with recognitions, as a board we certainly can't be everywhere all the time on our campuses, so we did call out a number of folks tonight that were specific that we had experienced, but what we also know at the end of the year here is we're coming to the end of yet another school year. All of our educators are tired. I want to give them a huge shout out. Our educators and our staff are tired of you. Thank you. Item 6.0, presentation, sexual health curriculum, Inyo County Office of Education. Let me review the process of how this is going to go before we call our presenters up. So what will happen first is that our, our guests will come up and they will present for us. After that, I will ask for a motion from the board to discuss and or approve item 6.1, which is the, to continue the use of the rights, respects, and responsibility sexual health education curriculum. Once we've had a motion and a second, if we do receive those, we'll open it up for discussion, at which point the board will be asking questions of our presenters. After the board has asked all of their questions and had those answered, We'll move on to public comment. If you have not had a chance to turn in one of your, your cards, please do so before then. And we will call you up one at a time for two minutes at the podium right there. Please respect that time. And uh, we'll do our best to make sure as many voices as possible can be heard. The California School Board Association allocates two minutes per speaker and 20 minutes per topic. Clearly, we're not going to get through it in 20 minutes looking at this stack right here. But please understand, we will do our best to make time for as many as possible tonight. All the board members are 100% unified in wanting to hear the thoughts, opinions, and values of our community. After public commentary, we'll move on to board discussion where we'll talk about this issue on our own here, and we'll move on to a vote. We'll be voting on item 6.1. For members of the public, if you have continued questions about our sex uh, sexual health curriculum for either our presenters or the district, please submit those in writing or via email directly to them or to our district office. During our time for public comments, if you would like to bring up something other than the sexual health curriculum, please hold that until item 7.0, public comment. With that, I'd like to introduce our presenters <coughs> for this evening. Steve, one point of order. Yes, you can. 
I just have two two quick things. Sorry, I'm gonna stand so everyone can hear me. Um, uh, one, kids are off limits. I just want to say it for both sides of the aisle. Like anyone up here, myself, I'll defend these folks' kids any day. Okay, kids are off limits. If anyone's gonna talk about personal kids, I'll shut you down. I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. Um, so let's just be. Yeah. That's why we're here. Um, and just. We're here to have discourse and be respectful. There's big differences of opinions. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I'm hoping we have the same goal. So thanks, Steve. Yeah. And what I'll say to that, Josh, is I know we have the same goal. Right? Every single person, if you're in this room tonight, it's because you care about kids. Right? And while we might differ in our opinions on how best to do that, what we know is we all have that shared value. Otherwise, you would not be here this evening. So I appreciate that. I want to echo what Josh says right there, right? That, that I hope that tonight, as you offer your perspectives and we engage in discussion, we can be hard on policy, right? That we can look at our curriculum and our practices within our district with a critical eye to get to the heart of what we do and why we do it. But at the same time, I hope we can be soft on people because every single person delivering that curriculum and what's going on in schools, those are educators who work hard every single day. And though we might not all agree on how they're doing the work, they are doing their best to serve every single student as best they can in this district, and that is without question. So again, I hope, can, hope we can be hard on policy, we can be as critical as we want, but again, soft on people. Karen and Alyssa, if you'd like to come up to our podium. School districts may contract with outside consultants to deliver required comprehensive sexual reproductive health education and HIV prevention education. That comes from Education Code 51936. That is something that as a district we can do. The Education Services Department from the Inyo County Office of Education provides districts with support in meeting the comprehensive sexual health education requirements outlined in the California Healthy Youth Act and California Health Standards by providing instruction in Inyo County's classrooms. This partnership began over 12 years ago as a way to reduce the burden of the classroom teachers in addressing some of the health standards. And when the, when the California Healthy Youth Act passed in 2016, this partnership helped the district meet those requirements as well. We're grateful for your partnership. With us this evening, we have Karen Kong. She is a prevention and intervention coordinator for the Inyo County Office of Education. And as a consultant to the district, she provides the required sexual reproductive health education in grades six through eight at BOSD. She's been a sexual reproductive health instructor for 10 years. Ed Code requires that instructors have expertise in comprehensive sexual health education and HIV prevention education and have knowledge of the most recent medically, medically accurate research on relevant topics. Karen is certified through the Sexual Health Education Training Program from the California Department of Public Health Sexually Transmitted Disease Control Branch. She engages in annual training to stay up to date on relevant topics. She has completed the training for the three R's curriculum. And we're also joined by Alyssa Toomey. She's the Assistant Superintendent of Education Services at the Inyo County Office of Education and has a multiple subject teaching credential, an administrative service credential, and a master's degree in curriculum and instruction and assessment. Her varied roles at the, at the uh, Department of Ed or at the uh, community, County Office of Education include serving as the lead, for the statewide health subcommittee through the California County Superintendents Association. Alyssa has been with the county office since 2009. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thanks. So, we'll, we'll be as succinct as, as we can because we know there's lots of folks to hear from tonight. And, and thank you for having us. Um, it's encouraging to see so many community members that care about our students and the quality of education at BUSD. I'm happy to be able to share information with the board tonight on behalf of the county office in support of these efforts. So let's start with why we do this. Um, you guys have talked a little bit about that. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> okay, Katie, you're going to move my clicker. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just make eye contact with you. Okay. okay. So we're starting with the why. Students who participate in well-designed sexual health education programs are more likely to improve their academic performance as well as a variety of healthy outcomes that protect, protect their reproductive health, as you can see on this slide. 
From a local perspective, there have been incidents over the last 10 to 15 years, like unintended pregnancy in middle school to STD outbreaks in high schools um, that have elevated our need for consistent, accurate instruction. Further supporting our why, the chart you see here are the adolescent birth rates in Inyo County from 2008 to 2018. These are our 15 to 19 year old students. Inyo's adolescent birth rate decreased by 58.8% over that 10 year period. In addition to seeing a need locally and knowing that providing a well-designed sexual reproductive health curriculum will lead to better outcomes for students, we ultimately are responsible for teaching the California health content standards. We have content standards in every curricular area. Content standards define what all students should know and be able to do. They describe the knowledge, skills, and understanding that students should have in order to attain high levels of competency in that subject area. Go ahead. As you can see, this table, oh, sorry, going back one. As you can see in this table, there are standards for growth and development in almost every grade level, and instruction for sexual health begins in fifth grade. This instruction provides students with the knowledge and skills they need to develop healthy attitudes concerning adolescent growth and development, body image, gender, sexual orientation, relationships, and family. Continuing on our why, um, in conjunction with the California Health Standards, CHIA, or the California Healthy Youth Act of 2016, provides specific guidance on content that prepares students with the knowledge and skills necessary to protect their sexual and reproductive health from HIV and other sexually transmitted infections and from unintended pregnancy. It also clearly states that parents and guardians have the right to opt their child out of the curriculum. I've included a link to the Ed Code as well as a summary of the various components as an addendum to this presentation. So this will, that will be posted later. So let's turn to the how. How do we meet the standards and comply with Ed Code? This graphic represents how educators approach instruction by starting with the facts. A fact is a provable, accurate statement based on scientific, medical, legal, sociological, or psychological research, or the opinion of most experts in a field. For example, according to Stanford Children's Health, the onset of puberty is younger than in previous decades. The sexual health curriculum that we are discussing this evening is not a how-to curriculum. Instructors do not explain sexual acts. Lessons are based in facts. Sorry. That's I'm okay. <laughs> That's okay. I guess the Zoom audience is having a tough time hearing. Do you want me to move this? I think it's a Zoom thing. Oh. Go ahead. Oh, one, one back? One back here. So remembering that the goal is to protect students' sexual reproductive health, the curriculum shares facts-based health science knowledge and skills instruction, like communication and refusal skills. What is age appropriate is governed by the health content standards and the California Healthy Youth Act. <coughs> this one's gonna get a little tricky. Lots of, <laughs> Lots of clicking. Okay, the legislation has defined the facts, what is considered age appropriate, medically accurate, et cetera. So now let's talk about values. Go ahead. Institutional values are values that are agreed upon and often represented in the policies of the district. For example, all students deserve to learn in a safe, inclusive learning environment. Board Policy 6142.1 outlines the district's policy on sexual health and HIV AIDS prevention instruction. Universal values are values that are agreed to by the consensus of people in society. For example, it is wrong to steal from others. This also includes California laws and regulations for schools that we are required to follow, including the Ed Code pertaining to the California Healthy Youth Act, which is on the slide two times now. Where we see a range of values 
is when it comes to personal values. A belief or opinion about the morals or ethics of an issue, about right and wrong, good and bad, relative importance of what one should or shouldn't do. Students are always encouraged to speak with a trusted adult to explore and form their personal values and beliefs. We honor diverse family values and beliefs while upholding the law. So in summary of our, of our how here, it is not the teacher's role to insert personal values into the curriculum. Instead, we teach from a foundation of facts and organizational and universal values. Students are always encouraged to speak with a trusted adult to explore and form their personal values and beliefs. Now that you have the foundational information about what is required in California and how we approach that, let's talk about how we choose one curricula over another. The process varies slightly by content area, but generally educator experts use a criteria or rubric to evaluate materials and present a recommendation to the trustees for board approval. In the case of the supplemental materials for sexual reproductive health education, the previous curricula had been in use for over 10 years and was a bit dated in look and feel. Additionally, sig significant adjustments were required to comply with the California Healthy Youth Act since it was in use prior to that 2016 <coughs> act. Thus, ICOE, Inyo County Office of Education, went through a review process recently to update the sexual and reproductive health education curriculum for this year that covers the same topics and content as the previous curriculum and is aligned to the, the grade level California content standards. ICOE presented the process to superintendents of all our districts in Inyo County last year, then began the work of reviewing the materials. We started by becoming familiar with the California Healthy Youth Act curriculum assessment tool. This served as a way to see how experts from the California Department of Public Health and the Department of Education rated various curricula for compliance with CHIA, California Healthy Youth Act. Our staff received training on the tool, then selected curriculum that was compliant or only needed minor adaptations for further review. Five curricula were selected for a more in-depth review by ICOE educators. You can see them here on the screen. For the more in-depth review, we looked again at alignment with the California Healthy Youth Act and student engagement. Did the curriculum include opportunities for students to actively participate? Were there a variety of tasks or choice in how the students are interacting or responding? Is the curriculum accessible to students, including supports for English learners, such as materials in Spanish? We also looked if the curricula had complementary materials for elementary school and high school, knowing that there are health standards in both ends, so those could be available to teachers should they choose to use them. Okay. The three R's curriculum aligned well with what had been in use in Inyo for over 10 years. The California version of the three R's has over 100 lessons for K through 12 health instruction. We gathered a handful of lessons for sixth through eighth grades in order to meet our criteria. What you are choosing to adopt this evening is a subset of 17 lessons. Ultimately, as teachers, our goal is to teach the standards. We use the curriculum as a teaching tool to get to mastery of the content standards. Curriculum is meant to be a guide and using our professional knowledge we tweak and amend it to fit the needs of our students so that they can master those content standards. For example, a teacher may choose to amend a lesson so that students discuss scenarios in small groups rather than as a whole class. Or we may not even use all the components that are listed in the plan. If you could go ahead and click. Another feature of the lessons that I'd like to point out is the advanced preparation for lesson section. This is information for the teacher to get ready to teach the lesson. It is not necessarily student facing. It's meant for the adults. If you could click twice more. Also, curriculum is often developed for a national market. In this case, the standards listed on the actual curriculum itself is our national standards. So during our review process, we aligned those to the California standards. So thank you again for having us here this evening and for your time um, at this time I don't know if we're are we taking your questions at this time
So we're going to have a, a motion to uh, discuss and or approve. And once that is, uh, once we do have a second okay. on that, then we'll move to discussions and have some questions for you, I'm sure. Thank you for your presentation. Mm -hmm. Item 6.1, discussion and or approval the conti con to continue the use of the rights, respect, and responsibility of sex sexual health education curriculum. Do I have a motion to uh, discuss and or approve item 6.1? All motion. Thank you very much. And do I have a second? All second. Thank you very much. So this is the time now for board discussion with our present or board questions and answers with our presenters. Okay, we're back it up. That's terrific. We're back that was up. fast. <laughs> <laughs> we'll move right in now, right? Okay. Let's go. Yeah, so, uh, Board members. Yes. Josh made the motion and Claudia second. Board members, questions for our presenters. No, no, not, not no. this presentation, but the curriculum we presented was the same. What we had not gotten to, we had not gotten to the selection process yet. We just told them about the necessity to select a new curriculum. And so they didn't know the curriculum specifically? They did not know this, not at that time, but, okay. but we did go back later. So remember, we serve as consultants to your district, and we do this on behalf of six different school districts. So we took on that process ourselves. And, and we did go twice to them, to yeah, the superintendents. I'll get into our policy. I'll, we'll project, like, I, like we said. Um, I'll get into policy and in most discussion, um, but we didn't follow policy. I'm not sure where, where it fell through the cracks, whether it was between ICLE and us or the board. So this is supplemental curriculum? Right, I've been told that, but we, I, if this is the time, then we can talk about the supplemental curriculum. So this is the time right now for questions for Alyssa right. and Ken. Okay. So we can, I can do that in a second. So I just wanted to clarify that, that Katie didn't know about this curriculum. Okay, mm -hmm. just, just to clarify, who are the ones in charge on teaching the lessons in the classroom? So it varies by grade level. So health standards are required of all K-12 teachers, right? We contract, we work with your school district as consultants to provide compliance with California Health and Youth Act just for sexual health education. So in, in that agreement, we work with sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. For other districts, we sometimes go into high school, they don't have health classes, or fifth grade because the standards are covered in fifth grade as well. But for BUSD, it's sixth through eighth. So when you go through the, the, the different schools, different classes, you do have the schedule to, to do your class to certain grade at that time. Mm -hmm. Correct. What if you are sick or you have an emergency or something else? Do you delegate someone else to teach the lessons or you reschedule? We reschedule. Yeah, we have a pretty small department, so we reschedule. Okay, one more question. How do you implement or how do you teach the lessons to the language learners, the English language learners? and the disability students, the students with disabilities. Do you want to answer the sure. students with disabilities? Yeah. And I'll take English language. So um, the student with disabilities. Um, can, can you move the microphone just a little bit? Sure. Um, the students with disabilities, um, it generally depends. If the students are um, in, in general population science yeah. classes, then, um, then they just participate in those science classes if they are not in general population science classes, then um, traditionally what I do is schedule something specifically for the special ed students and go into their special ed classroom. Can I ask you that over here? I'd like you to know that all of our special education kids, Excuse me. all of our students, we, we push them into science classes. They're all exactly It's Derek. It's Derek. <laughs> Sorry about that. I didn't realize that was Derek. Go again. Time as their, as their fellow students. 
And what about if one student is just like that, barely learning English? Well, we, have, we, have, we have our liaison that goes in with them to help translate during that time period. Thank you. And in addition, um, we use strategies for, um, for English learners that um, most teachers are familiar with in terms of like an integrated ELD approach with development of vocabulary, um, uh, you know, side conversations in terms of explanations and, and materials in Spanish. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, Um, traditionally, we have somewhere between zero and four students who opt out per grade level. So, okay, yeah. so out of the 150 plus kids per grade level, we usually have somewhere between four to zero who opt out. And that's per grade level. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, um, it it um, it you know there's a little little ups and downs, but um, I can say that that there were there were um, off the top of my head one for the seventh graders this year at Home Street. That's the number that I remember. And so yeah, it 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 varies a little by grade level, especially if there are especially if there are families, um, you know, entire families who have multiple students who who choose to opt out. But um, yeah, those are the sort of general range. And what do Um, the the school arranges for them, generally speaking, to go to the library. Any other questions? Um, yeah. Have you come across to a, uh, a situation where the parents decide to opt in for the sexual education classes and all that, but then when you get to a certain topic that is uncomfortable for them. Can they opt out? Or how did that work? So do you want to go with Helen? Sure. So so generally topics are integrated when we when if it's good instruction, your your lessons build on each other. So that means you're gonna get various content in various lessons because we we review, we repeat, because that's how we learn. So um, Generally, for this situation, you would see par parents opting out of the entire thing, or not. Just for clarification there, though, if a parent did, after several of these lessons, feel like they wanted to opt out, would there still be that option? Depends, really? right? It depends on, on um, where we are. Um, in Ed Code, you can opt out of curriculum, but not people. And so it really depends on what we're talking about. All people. You can't opt out of people. Can you if, just for, for clarification, Alyssa? For for for, for clarification. Can yeah. Can you clarify? I'm not sure if I yeah. understand. Can I just make sure asking. I can I just make sure I understand that? Mm -hmm. It's the equivalent of saying in um, the 11th grade history class that if there's a unit on Black history, parents can't opt out of that section <laughs> because Correct. that's focused on people. Correct. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you very much. That's clear. Any other questions? Um, so at what, at what point did the material that was presented in the past become incomplete or non-compliant? Was it a gradual thing? Was it a, a, a from one year to another? Right. It I, Really, 2016, when, when the California Healthy Youth Act came into being, that curriculum was a little bit needed some supplement because that it very clearly says what happens in middle school and high school um, so i would say we had to at that point start to supplement that curriculum um, and so at this point it was kind of like well back in 2009 or 10 when we started with this there weren't really many curriculums available curricula available um, and now with the passage of, of the California Healthy Youth Act, there's many more to look at. 
and so we felt like it was time. There were really only two to look at back then, and so, and they weren't even from California. So we felt it was important to kind of open the process again and take a look. And it was important to align with what we were already doing. So the content really hasn't changed. No. When you say we, as far as choosing the curriculum, who, who is we? The education services staff. Uh, how many people does that entail? And we have, what, four in our department? Four or five? Four or five? There's four or five of us, not all, all of us were involved in the but review. But all of them work at the county office of ed? Correct. Mm -hmm. So you didn't bring anyone from the district? Mm -hmm. No teachers, no parents, no? Nope. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Right? And there it is. Should I bring it? <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's not have any distractions of our speakers, please. Let me get a speaker. I, I understand there were, um, you had markers as far as how you chose the curriculum. After reading this, I, I just struggle with this aligning with with sexual education. I want to emphasize education because uh, I'm gonna, this is going to be said time and time again when we do have a chance to discuss. But this, in my opinion, is no offense on the on the reflection on the people, as we said earlier. This is sexualization of children, not sexual. <laughs> This is the time for questions. We're talking about What's the your curriculum. Question? What's your question? the curriculum. There was no input from the district. There was no input from staff, teachers, parents. And so what's the question? Why not? Often Why not? Excuse me. Josh, we will have time for board discussion. You can direct this to us, and we okay, can get into this as needed. Back and forth that we what have is the? We can only do one thing at a time, right? So That's I'm, the way we're going to run this meeting. What's your question for our presenters? Okay. I'm confused how we landed on this. So we offer this as a service to our district. By no means do you have to accept our service. Amen. Um, yeah. 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 However, however, the district is still responsible for teaching those standards and complying with that so act. I understand. Um, I do have the code and. I believe it's 51931. Just to clarify, these are questions about the presentation, and then later on we can clarify as a board. Okay, I'll, I'll bring that up later so we can discuss it. Um, yeah. Do you have any more questions for our presenters? Can I answer the tool question? I do have one. What is your pregnancy rate right now, each year? I, I, I didn't bring that tonight. Um, so in 2005 to 2007, there were 82 teen pregnancies in Inyo County. And in 2019 to 2021, which is the last they have record of um, by the California Department of Public Health, there were 35. Thank you. Um, just a quick question for you. Uh, is that board member questions? Um, the company that makes this three-hour curriculum, is there a parent company? What's the name? It's Advocates for Youth. Advocates for Youth. And do they create other materials as well? Yes. They have, well, as I said, they have over 100 lessons for health education in K-12. Okay. So we focused on these, the 17 that we've narrowed down. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. And then that advanced preparation. Those materials that are students facing or that are only teacher facing, those are not used with students. So there are a variety of the advanced preparation materials that are, if you, if you look at the advanced preparation um, instructions, it says get these queued up for the students. So some are to, for the teacher just to prep with and some are that you actually show. So if you look at the sixth grade, everyone has body parts. There are actual um, videos that go with that that go through the female and male body parts. And some of those are going to be for instructor only and student only. Correct. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions for our presenters? Go ahead. Um, what is the cost associated with this curriculum? It's a, it's available for free. <laughs> From 
No. From the company. Um, before you guys are done, I do I do want to make sure everybody in the room knows I, I have attended Mrs. Combs' class, uh, both in my previous term and this the sixth grade one. And I, I do believe that you have an outstanding personality to handle this kind of awkward curriculum for this awkward age. I really, I really do. Sincerely, I sat in this classroom. Um, I can't say that I enjoyed it, <laughs> um, but I don't agree with the content. Okay. We'll, we'll get into that. So thank you. Any other questions from the board? Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. So the way we'll do this this evening is to call three people at a time. I'll give you numbers one, two, and three, and then four, five, and six. And if the three of you could come up and then present in order, but that might help us move through a little bit more efficiently. Um, we will have a timer that will be up on the screen so you can monitor your time. There's two minutes for presentation. I will close you at the end of those two minutes. I'll do my best to do that as gracefully as possible. Um, when you do come up, please inter introduce yourself to the board so we can know who you are. Our number one, Ann Strom. Number two, Sarah Steck. And number three, Dr. Eric Richmond. Good evening, I'm Ann Strom. Uh, thank you. Say it loud. I'm going to say it loud then, all right. You want it loud, you're going to get it loud. Um, thank you, Superintendent Colker and um, school board members, um, and teachers and educators and the like, and staff who are here. Um, it shows our commitment to this community and to the kids in this community. Um, as Josh alluded to, sex ed is automatically more provocative topic uh, than any other. Nobody gets embarrassed or red-faced or blushes or giggles during geography class. Um, but talking about sex and the fact that it can make us uncomfortable is not good enough reason to deny our students important information about their bodies and how they work. Let's face it, the adolescents in this community don't start thinking about sex only after they sit through this class. Um, it's all around us. It's on TikTok. It's on TV. It's on music. It's everywhere. And they talk to each other about it. Just a moment. Yep. Let me take a moment to interrupt. I'm going to ask you to please hold your applause. There are 61 people we'd like to get through tonight. And we know that there's many of you who support both sides of this issue. Please allow them to come, allow them to speak freely without interruption, and we'll do our best to make sure every single person is, help, help, is heard. Thank you for your compliance in that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the current curriculum, or the proposed curriculum, isn't telling young people to go have all the sex. Um, what it is doing is giving them correct information and tools they can use to communicate and set healthy boundaries with each other. Um, I've read lots on social media this week about this curriculum being pornographic. Um, it caused me to look at it with great interest. Um, I didn't find any porn, but when I asked people online where specifically they found this pornographic content, not a single person named a specific lesson or page number to me. There was silence. It was crickets. Okay. Now, it's possible readers of this uh, curriculum don't like some of the content. Um, judging on last year's Inyo County meetings and others, maybe the gay stuff is scary, you know? Um, but acknowledging that gay and gender nonconforming people exist is no more pornographic than letting students know what their body parts are. Thank you, you know? so much for your contributions. That was two minutes. We oh, thanks. Yep. We appreciate your perspective. Hi, my name is Sarah Steck. I was a teacher a few years ago, and I had a son who went through school. Um, I did look through the curricula, curriculum, and it um, is facts. It looks like a good thing. P p kids should know that from uh, uh, 
good source rather than TikTok or wherever they're getting information. And um, also, the fact that you can opt out, it makes a lot of sense if you don't want your child to have that education that uh, for all the reasons that the, the presentation had, they should uh, take their kids out. But I think it's a really good thing to have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, hello. Two minutes. Better get going here. Um, I'm Dr. Eric Richmond. I've been in the community for about 33 years. Um, I have three kids that went all the way through the Bishop School District. Um, and uh, I've served on this board for 10 years um, in the past. Um, at any rate, um, I heard that there are people in the community that were looking at getting rid of comprehensive sex education. So I do what I do. I just looked at the studies. So I did a deep dive into it. I found out uh, it didn't take much of a uh, much of a look to find out that the U.S. ranks higher than uh, many other developed countries in teenage pregnancies and sexual transmitted disease. Uh, we're higher than the U.K. We're higher than Canada. Uh, I found a, an article, um, um, you know, uh, that that uh, I found quite interesting. I thought I'd share, but I'm assuming that everybody in the room, as was said by our board president, that. We're all interested in the same thing. We want, it, we want what's best for children. And certainly what's best for children is low teen uh, pregnancy rates and certainly a decrease in sexually transmitted disease. So uh, National Library of Medicine published October 14th there's a, of uh, 2011. Uh, it's a study that was uh, uh, basically repeated over and over again. Um, it's uh, published in the National Center for Biotech Information and it compared absence-only education to teen birth rates, and basically higher levels of absence education mean higher levels of uh, teen pregnancy, pure and simple. Uh, it accounted for socioeconomic status, ethnic group. So, but we can go further, I got 24 seconds. Um, top five states when, it took, when looking at teen pregnancy all had the same thing. They had absence only education. Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, Alabama, California, with comprehensive sex education was two and a half times lower teen birth rate. So if you're looking for your reasons to continue with comprehensive teen birth rates, then it's to continue with comprehensive sex education. Absence only education, absence only education was linked to an increase in teen birth rates. Thank you. We could have uh, Steve Park, Hans Horendahl, Jorendahl, and Alyssa Morrison, or Elise Morrison. Thank you for joining us tonight. Okay. Thank you, board members, for the challenging job you do to make decisions that affect the students at the USD. And I well know that there have been many over the last three years. I've participated in some of them. Uh, my name is Steve Park. I'm a retired BUHS teacher and current substitute teacher. I spent this morning reviewing the sex ed curriculum and I was very impressed with what I saw. I co-taught a sex ed unit in seventh grade almost 20 years ago uh, and was shocked at the level of knowledge and misinformation the students already had about sex at seventh grade. The unit we taught focused only on the biology of sex, STIs, and the mechanics of sex. We spent much of our time correcting misinformation and myths. I'm pleased to see that the current curriculum places so much emphasis on building healthy relationships and dealing with emotions. Teens really need this. I also like that the curriculum includes examples with LGBTQ students. In the last four to five years that I was teaching, I have had LGBTQ students in every one of my classes. Uh, and BUSD needs to serve all the students in this district, not just some. I urge the board to continue using this curriculum because this knowledge will help students make good decisions. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to say real quickly that yourself, I... Please. Huh? If you could introduce yourself, introduce yourself your name. Oh, uh, I'm Hans Jordendahl. Um, 
Yeah, I just want to say I really think the curriculum is excellent. I read it last night and this morning. I don't see that there's any sexualization of children. I think there's information based on facts and science in there, and I think the teachers are doing a good job. They should continue teaching this thing. Thank you. Okay, hello, my name is Elise Morrison. I have three children, one at each uh, BUSD campuses. Full disclosure, I work for the County Office of Education, but that does not sway my opinion on this matter. I'm a parent first, and that will always be my most important job. I was also an ICOB employee when I was here last time I spoke during the controversial mask meeting. And um, at that meeting, I shared my concerns about the risk posed to children um, who are forced to wear masks. So basically, I was asking for the freedom to choose as parents. Here we are with the freedom to choose as parents. That is why I'm here again today. We as parents have the choice to have our children participate in these sex education classes or to have our children opt out. Freedom of choice is not limited only to the activities, curriculum, and ideas that you might agree with. We already, our children already know about sex and are naturally very curious and seek out answers. They seek out answers from their friends, their friends' older siblings, their older siblings, the internet, porn, and I would, all of which can have dangerous misinformation surrounding sex and relationships. I am happy that we have a curriculum where students feel comfortable to ask questions in front of other students, in front of other adults. Um, abstinence is an unrealistic expectation, and even if they remain abstinent throughout their teenage years, they will eventually have sex as adults. It is imperative that they're aware of safe and, safe and healthy ways to have sex. Children also need a space to discuss different situations that may arise so they can make informed and consensual decisions. And the sex ed class provides that safe space. I have 11 minutes or seconds. Um, I'm, I don't really. <laughs> Sorry. Bernadette Johnson, Eric Rotondo, and Roseanne Howard. Um, good evening, uh, board members. Thank you so much for your community service. And I'm gonna be really short. Um, this is a topic that's very important to me. Um, I was an unwed teen mother at 19, um, and my parents were not comfortable talking to me about sex education. I went to a very small rural school, and we just didn't have a curriculum. So please, I implore you, please continue this very fact-based curriculum. I reviewed it. Um, I talked with um, family members who have gone through some variation at Bishop um, and I think the most important part of what I read the last week is the part about relationships respect and consent so please do future generations um, a benefit um, and continue to offer this very very important curriculum thank you No, no, no. I said the California School Board Association, their policy is to recommend that we, their policy is to keep each discussion item to 20 minutes. We will not be doing that tonight. Are you planning to address all of the cards? Then? We're going to do our best. Okay. Yeah. Good evening. My name is Erica Rotondo. I'm a family medicine physician living here in Bishop. I would like to thank the school board and the superintendent for all that you do for the children of the community. Um, one thing I'd like to say is that I am very appreciative of the current curriculum that Bishop has for its students. The American Academy of Pediatrics states, quote, 
decades of decades of data have demonstrated that comprehensive sex education programs are effective in reducing risk of STIs and unplanned pregnancy. These benefits are critical to public health. However, comprehensive sex education goes even further by instilling youth with a broad range of knowledge and skills that are proven to support social emotional learning, positive communication skills, and development of healthy relationships. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Roseanne Howard. This room is very familiar to me because I was a teacher in the Bishop uh, School District for 37 years, and um, I have high regard for our esteemed school board and the hard work they do, and I love children. I probably taught many of you here or your children. Um, when I taught in Home Street, there were two occasions when seventh grade girls came up and at least they had the courage to say, I have a friend who's pregnant. I didn't really think it was their friend. It wasn't their friend. They were so scared. They didn't know what to do. They didn't feel they could talk to their parents. They, I don't know what they did um, in the end because it was not my business, but I did refer them to where they needed to be referred. I don't want any child to have to face that ever. It was, it was scary for me, and I could see the anguish they were in. And things like this, when kids don't have the, the correct information, like sex ed to begin with, cause them to make some very damaging decisions or hurt themselves or do drastic things that have permanent grief. And so I would like everyone to consider that. We're not, I read the, the lessons, almost all of them. It took me several days. I don't know how a teacher could teach it in 50 minutes. Um, but it, it is a good program. It will save lives. It will save the lives of babies that are unwanted. It will save the lives of, of children. Thank you. Before I call the next three, if we could give uh, Roseanne Howard just one more uh, round of applause for 37 years in our district. Woo! Regardless of your position on this issue, that is an amazing feat. The kind of contribution you made to this community is immeasurable. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your service. Some of the most joyful years of my life. <laughs> uh, Jen Davis, Fran Hunt, and Lori McGraw. My name is Jen Davis. I do not desire to eliminate the sex ed, I do not, but I do demand that it be changed. There is a direct correlation to the implementation of public sex education and the rise of teen pregnancy and STIs. The statistic that was quoted by a doctor today is false. That is false. There's a correlation of the sex education publicly and the rise of STIs and teen pregnancy. A lower rate of teen pregnancy is a misnomer. What you actually mean is a lower, weight, a lower rate of teens giving birth, and that is due to chemical and surgical abortion. <clears throat> what I am here to say, I've said before, I do love and follow Jesus, but for these two minutes I appeal to you with the science of psychology. I have a bachelor's in psychology and I've done intensive study in human sexuality for my master's. I have worked with teens here for the last 14 years. Pornography is printed or visual material containing the explicit description of sexual organs or activity. It is not only harmful but devastating for students' sexual, relational, and brain development to be taught such material. There are many reasons why. I would like to focus on one, borrowing from a theory from the famous psychologist Eric Erickson. 
A little like the unfolding of a rosebud, each petal opens up at a certain time in a certain order, which is determined through genetics and design. If we interfere with the natural order of development by pulling a petal forward prematurely or out of order, we ruin the development of the entire flower. The sexuality of a student is like a rosebed. It is designed to bloom and open through a certain order. And if adults interfere with that process by exposing students to any sexual material that they are not yet ready to process, we risk harming the healthy sexual development of each student. When you pull apart a rose, even if you do so slowly, you will almost certainly ruin the flower, and most definitely you will never be able to put the petal back. You have changed the flower forever, and you have harmed its development. This is true for students who are exposed to sexually explicit material. My hope is that any public employees who choose this kind of material are ignorant of the ramifications of which I just spoke. Now that the curriculum which is in current use has been exposed, it would be criminal Excuse to me. vote me. its continued. Let me make it clear to everybody. Let me make it clear to everybody in the room our protocol for managing disruptions, because that was a disruption. First, there will be a warning. Then there will be a second warning. After that, the person will be asked to leave. If there is continued disruption, the room will be cleared. And let me make it clear, tonight the board will vote on this action item. We will have a vote. We would like your input, your thoughts, and your opinions. But it will, have, it will happen with respect and decorum and adherence to our, pol our policies and guidelines. I hope that we get to hear from everyone tonight. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I'm Fran Hunt. Uh, I live here in Bishop, and I thank the board and staff. Can you pull the microphone a little bit up? It, it's, yeah, it's got a mind of its own at the moment, but we'll do our best here. I uh, thank the board and staff for all your work for our community. Um, I think we're really fortunate to have such an effective uh, sexual health education curriculum in our BUSD schools. Um, I think it's wonderful that our teen pregnancy rates have dropped dramatically since it was put in place. Um, and I think it's fortunate as well that a robust sex educational curriculum is required in our state. So I hope the school board will see our local curriculum for what it is, an appropriate, effective, and necessary program that supports our students' physical, emotional, and mental health, all of those. But I really hadn't thought a lot about this curriculum until I started to hear all the outrage, uh, like, like Ann Strom said, uh, the outrage about it. Um, I heard it was pornographic uh, and graphic. I heard some other things that I won't even mention. Um, so I just had to read it too. Um, and I didn't find any of those things, but I did find an excellent uh, fact-based curriculum geared to the real-life world circumstances, relationships, challenges, and questions our students actually have and experience these days, have and experience these days. Whether we wish they did or not, they have them. Um, so I'm here tonight because I believe that knowledge is power. And I believe that a robust sex ed curriculum can literally safeguard our students' lives and futures. Literally save lives. Uh, our students are safer because of this curriculum and this program. Um, it's worth repeating that local teen pregnancy rates have dropped since it was put in place, but they're still nowhere near acceptable rates. And so the last thing we need to be doing is dropping, watering down, scrapping this curriculum. Um, parents can always opt out. Um, but this is an important program and it should stay in place. Thank you. My name is Lori McGraw, and we are going to do a freeze frame role play from eighth grade. Sydney is a trans girl who has a big crush on Z. Both are free thinkers who don't like labels. Sydney and Z have been hanging out together for a few weeks and enjoying a lot of the same things. It's clear that they are attracted to each other, but they've never kissed or touched. Plan a role play in which Sydney talks with Z and having sex about having sex and they make a decision. So those were the instructions for the role play given to the kids. So I'm Sydney. 
I was assigned male at birth, but I've never identified as a boy or a man. You're a girl, but not a girly girl. I really like the fact that you're kind of androgamous. But I'm not sure how, our, um, how things should get started. I think that we should talk about our feelings. I'm Z. Biologically, I was assigned female at birth, but I hate to be put in a box. Society puts everybody in and I identify as gender queer. I work hard to have a gender non-conforming appearance and style. I enjoy gender bending and I feel like with Sydney, I have finally met someone who really gets me. My grandson had to do this and he refused and he still had to. One last thing, um, as adults, this is a really confusing assignment. Not only is it confusing content, but some of these terms, this, you know, what do they even mean? These kinds of roles, role plays are inappropriate. We're not against uh, sex education that's age appropriate, but we are against sexualization of kids and grooming them into a lifestyle and accepting of things that is not what is meant to be. The three R's really should be reading, writing, and arithmetic. Thank California you. schools are losing that battle. Thank you. Not sure if I'm getting this one correct. Cindy Weherenbrock. Warren Brock, thank you. Amy Beck and Kelly Brown. Kelly Brown. Hi, I'm Cindy Warren Brock, and I'm going to read. Um, some from the seventh grade STD risks and the, the, the header is no risk for STDs. Aside from continuous abstinence, okay, continuous abstinence, meaning not having oral, anal, or vaginal sex with another person for a period of time, very few shared sexual behaviors carry no risk. The activities here are more related to intimacy, with the exception of masturbation and mutual masturbation. These behaviors are important because they help people learn about their bodies and build connection between people without any risk of STDs or pregnancy. And those things that we can do are we can bathe together at 12 years old, we can kiss on the lips, we can have mutual masturbation, we can have solar, solo masturbation, we can hold hands, and we can have sex ever so often, and we have no risk of STDs. My question is, a few years ago, uh, there was a sports team here that they were practicing their homework. They were doing mutual masturbation and showering together. Their, their sport stopped. They couldn't do it anymore, and the coach got fired. And yet they were excuse doing. Me, excuse me. I want to ask you, how does that connect to our sex, our sex health? Education? Well, they were doing the homework. That's that's. I mean, they were doing this, and yet they got in trouble. And the other thing is, is there's no mention of any sagittary rape and what that carries. That would be a good thing to to put in here, also. Thank you very much for your time. Back. Good evening. Thanks for having me. You guys do a great job, a hard job, really hard job. Um, my name is Amy Beck, and I'm a yard aide here at Home Street in the morning. And let me tell you, this is the place that I hear the very most f bombs and n words all day, and in fact, even in movies and R-rated movies, especially sixth graders. <laughs> they like to scream it very loudly, which I find very offensive, and I try to make them not do it, but that those are the facts. Um, I, too, saw this outreach online, and I read the sixth grade curriculum. Um, I think the only one I was concerned about was sixth grade because, honestly, our kids are online, and um, by seventh and eighth grade, they've probably seen more than I've seen online as far as porno, literally, and they have bad ideas from that. So we as responsible adults 
needs to give need to give them the tools to say no, which I found in the sixth grade curriculum. It, they, it was not a sexual context that the uh, saying no was involved with. It was um, just peer pressure, like uh, let's steal a little money from my mom was the example. So it gave the kids good tools on how to say no. It gave them biological facts. And um, I also agree with teaching about LGBTQ because um, 98% of parents apparently agree with this because only zero to four ever opt out. So our community, 98% or better, agree with what we're teaching here. And if you don't agree, you can opt out, which I think sixth grade, you know, maybe some of those kids are still a little innocent and haven't been online as much. But chances are, even in sixth grade, they've been exposed to um, aggressive pornography and they may think that's what the other sex likes. So this will teach them the boundaries. Thank you. My name is Kelly Brown. That last role play was so much fun. We're going to do another one. Kelly, before you begin, so, Kelly, before you begin, can I just give a word? It was my mistake and I apologize to everybody for that. Right? Our protocol is to have one speaker come up at a time. I'll allow you to finish your two role plays because you were the two speakers who we called. But after that, once your name is called, please come up by yourself and one at a time you can present to the board. Thank you. So this is the instructions on this next role play. Morgan and Terrence met several months ago at a party. Morgan identifies as queer and is very active in the LGBTQ group at his school. Terrence isn't sure whether he's straight or bisexual and has only dated girls, but both Morgan and Terrence know that they're attracted to each other. Plan a role play in which Morgan talks to Terrence about what's going on and they make a decision about whether to have sex. So I'm Morgan. Terrence and I live in the same apartment building and are in the same home room. Terrence has dated girls and seems straight, but he also seems attracted to me. Last week, you bumped into him in the laundry room in your building and after lots of accidental touches, you ended up kissing. But then he stopped and left. Now he just sent a text asking if I'd meet him in the laundry room. I decided to go because I want to have an honest conversation. I don't want to begin anything with someone who is so confused. I'm Terrence. I date girls. I date girls I like, but haven't done much sexually with them. I've kissed a couple of them, but didn't find it very exciting. Now I feel very attracted to Morgan. When I kissed him last week, it felt wonderful, but also confusing. I just can't stop thinking about Morgan and, imagine Morgan and imagining his touch. I think I want to have sex with him, but I don't want our family or friends to find out because they would disapprove. So one of the main things that about these role plays is that these kids are being forced to do them when they're uncomfortable doing it. And that's not okay. Um, some of the content of this stuff might be on TikTok. Parents need to opt out of that. Amen. Opt out of TikTok. Yeah. Be more in charge of what your kids are listening to. Thank you. Aaron Gilpin, Grant Schumacher, and Andrea Daniels. Hi. Oh, it's perfect for me. <laughs> Thank you guys for everything you do. Um, I'm a parent. My kids are at Round Valley right now, but they will be coming to Bishop Middle School and High School. Um, I'm very excited about this, and I love this curriculum. I am in full support of it, and I just want you to know that. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Grant Schumacher. I'm a grandparent and have my children here at... Uh, BUJSS, and I just want to read a, an excerpt from the reproduction basics of the curriculum for 12-year-old children. In one particular lesson, the teacher is directed to describe the following definition to sixth graders. Vaginal sex, sometimes called sexual intercourse, is when an erect penis is inserted into a lubricated vagina. If this results in ejaculation, semen is released from the penis. 
it goes to, the, to describe the process of fertilization between a, a sperm and egg. But later in this very lesson, in the teacher resource section, the teacher is instructed not to distribute the previous information. Very confusing. In the same lesson, 12-year-old students are instructed to talk with a parent or caregiver about the following statements and then decide if they are fact or myth. Fact or myth one. If two people have vaginal sex standing up, then pregnancy is not possible because the sperm will just fall out. <laughs> myth or fact number two. If two people have sex in certain positions, then the pregnancy is not possible because of gravity. Uh, myth or fact three. If two people have vaginal sex in a swimming pool, pregnancy is not possible. Myth or fact four, if someone jumps up and down after unprotected vaginal sex, the sperm will, inside will just get confused. So these are all simple in the, in the thing, in the actual curriculum, and I'm only asking the parents to do, this is what part of the curriculum is. If this is what you want your kids to, to understand at that level, at that age, that is your decision. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, I am Andrea Daniels. May the blessings of Jesus be upon all of you. I am not against sex ed, but, but, this is the curriculum for 12 year olds. Oh my goodness. The sex education instructor can or did show the amaze videos from YouTube entitled How a Boner Grows. Students can see that this video is produced by amaze.org. You guys should watch it very educational, disgusting, and can access a plethora of other enticing videos if they choose. And you know the curiosity of children. They are curious and may watch them all and share with their friends. These are some of the videos on amaze.org. How a boner grows. Can anyone get an erection? Can you break a boner? How many times can you masturbate in one day? Does a penis size really matter? Am I ready to have sex? Anatomy assigned sex at birth, male and female. Is it normal to watch porn? Females and masturbation. What is, what is sexual orientation, LGBTQT? Wait, does this oral sex count as sex? Does, excuse me, does pulling out prevent pregnancy? Does sex hurt for the first time? What are pronouns? What is transgender? coming out LGBTQ. Did these videos come recommended through the state curriculum? Or did they come from the instructor? instructor? Why do you want to sexualize our children? Are you getting children sick, groomed for sex slavery for the elites? What is your goal, people? You obviously want them used for a sinister plan. Parents, are you OK with this? Don't you think you, sh you should be responsible for their sex ed? My mother was. Are you okay with your with the school sexualizing your children? Thank you for your comments. We appreciate you. <laughs> Patricia Schlichting, Jennifer Bodine, and Carrie Ar Arnall. Jennifer Bodine. Um, so the opt-out obviously is uh, zero to four because nobody gets them. Um, we all know what a permission slip is. Um, that's kind of how it should be. If you don't have a permission slip, then you don't go on a field trip. Same should be here. Um, it's the opposite with the sex ed. Um, if you don't get your paper, and it's not something your kid <laughs> participates. So um, I did some digging because I didn't get mine this year. Um, my child had to participate. Uh, the opt-out states that the curriculum is age-appropriate and medical-based, states 
that condoms are 100% effective and prevents pregnancy, um, not abstinence. Um, that states, that is stated in the opt-out form. The seventh grade lesson, um, using condoms effectively, it directly states um, condoms are the only method in protecting from pregnancy and STDs, not abstinence. The opt-out form is misleading and not truthful about the curriculum. It preys on the busyness of parents. It hides the truth under the California Department of Education standard centered dis and disease control, preventing and national sexual standards to pretend to comfort children, um, parents, to make you feel comfortable with doing the class. We need an opt, or we don't need an opt out, we need a permission slip to do this, because um, nobody's getting their papers uh, to sign. It's time to protect our kids and not expose them to this. Um, did the board approve this curriculum? And um, if anybody's curious, you can get your opt-out forms in the back of the room. Thank you. Amen. Hi, my name's Carrie Arnold. I actually have this almost the same response. We didn't talk about it earlier, but my kids are in the high school and I requested opt-out and the teachers just forgot. So I felt that it was useless to opt out. I think there should be a permission slip or something, as if you do with a field trip, something where there's more clear boundaries. There's several areas in the high school where things are just forgotten and things get overlooked in many areas, kids in crisis. I would say even kids running around the classroom, running people over and teachers trying to stop that. I am pro-responsibility, consequences, healthy relationships, life. I want our country to be based on life, not death. Foundations of our country. I'm not anti-sex. I mean, I love my family. I have a family. Um, as a parent, I'm looking for openness and courage from the board to not only follow the state guidelines, but to look at kids there are a portion of kids that are in crisis i hear this at the high school from many of my children's friends and trying to help them work through their problems from being exposed from broken relationships extensive sexual explo exploitive material at a young age i feel is inappropriate i'm hoping to look that you will look at the side effects of what chemical uses condoms and things that are not 100 percent be presented to the children because i feel that they are being misled with information i personally used a pill and suffered a severe illness for a long time and i am i'm very wanting children to know that they could have a serious consequence like that it's very important maybe i didn't suffer it as a young age but i did suffer it at an older age and i do feel that that was part of my journey and that's why i want kids to to know that this is a serious thing that they're using. Thank you very much for your time. Lisa Adams, Vicki French, and Christy Morton. Morton. Hi there, my name is Lisa Adams. I'm, I'm one of the nurses here in Bishop. Hey, the one thing that I'm really concerned about is that um, the, I don't think that the families really know what is being taught in these classes. If they knew, they would be, you know, they would have enough education to decide whether their, their kids are going to be a part of this or not. Let me give you just, this is part of the curriculum, using condoms effectively. In step three, the instructor will have a wooden penis model and several external male condoms ready. The teacher explains that um, she will model the correct steps using the external condom. Then she'll go around the room and ask the kids to, to do it. If they mess up, well, she'll explain it, do it again, and then it, they go on to the next group. They also do instruction on a female condom and use a speculum to put the condom into the speculum and show it to the children to show them where the entrance of the vagina is and, you know, I look at my grandson, who is 12 years old, and 
I cannot even imagine exposing him to this. And there's a lot of children out there that are not ready. Parents know whether their children are ready or not. And they need the information before they make the decision to have them be a part of this. That is so important. And I think that this board needs to make sure that that happens. Parents need to know. They need the education to make the right decisions. You don't just pour it out and say, this is what we're going to do, and it may not be right for the kids. Thank you. I'm Vicki French, and I'd like to start out by just raise of hands. Who has read the curriculum? Who has looked at the curriculum? Okay, great. That's great. I'm surprised. Um, as we're talking about the sexualization of kids, um, the definition of sexualization of kids is exposing children to sexual matters that are intended only for adults, like unprotected anal sex. Things like that are, are shocking to see even the little the girls that came up here and talked uh, and looking at them and thinking, this is what they're teaching. This is what they're learning. It's as a result of the sexualization of children, some children demonstrate sexual interest and or behavior at earlier ages than ever. And you know, the, um, I asked, I sent an email out to Ms. Colker and asked her if she had read the uh, curriculum and she said that she had reviewed it. And I'm alarmed that we don't have the approval or know who approved the curriculum. And so I just want to appeal to the board that, and just say that what you decide tonight will show everybody which side you're on. You're either going to protect the children and stand against the, this perverse curriculum, or you're going to continue promoting it. And the, the choice is yours. And I don't know, did everybody read it and read it thoroughly? Because there's a lot in it. And in the end, if you won't protect the children, there's laws that will. And there's a lot of us that are watching and digging in to pay attention to what's being taught. Thank you. Maybe you can help. I don't know how to put it back in. I don't want to talk. Won't stay in. Don't start me yet. Well, I think that's it. Well, I'll it. go ahead and start. Oh, I'm not on. Should I shut it off? Ready to roll. My name is Christy Morton, and thank you for serving our community. Appreciate it. I can't imagine any school district to buy into this indoctrination and mind poisoning of our young and innocent children. First, it is not your job to teach children such aberrant knowledge and behaviors. This agenda needs to be rewritten as physical science or health science and not until high school to teach children reproductive health. It is certainly not your right nor place to teach anything else. What this is doing is planting seeds of devious thoughts and perceptions in our children. Thoughts they will now investigate and test thanks to the curriculum. This language is not anything they would be taught in their own home. This curriculum has crossed the line of morality, civility, and self-respect. You tell children of anal sex, masturbation, deep throat kissing, oral sex, bathing together, and mutual masturbation. I don't want to see it, and I know our children don't. This plants a seed of curiosity in kids that they need to not ever know, especially from school curriculum. While we're busy educating, modeling, and teaching our children about love, caring, self-control, abstinence, dignity, self-worth, good moral values, and purity, you are tearing down the very foundation of a healthy self-esteem, positive thinking, and morals. This curriculum will cause great harm to our children as well as conflict within their own innocent hearts. This undermines our parental rights to educate our children about personal life choices and how to make them as well as the consequences of immoral behavior. Bad choices will reflect a young child for the rest of their life. 
If these topics were on Facebook or any other social platform, we would be banned. As a foster parent, CPS would pull a child from my care in an instant if I attempted to overcome and poison a child with such predatory, pornographic, and borderline molestation of a child. I will speak up, fight for the children, lobby, rally, attend, and push back against this illicit curriculum to indoctrinate our children into dark, seedy, abusive, and absolute immoral behaviors. Thank you for the two-minute opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Lori Warta, Michelle Mulligan, and Betty Wagoner. My name is Lori Warta. I'm from Bishop. I'd like to speak to you about the seventh grade lesson entitled Using Condoms Effectively, specifically the homework assignment Media Hunt. Did they use condoms? Let's try a scenario. Imagine that your 12 year old child is instructed to watch three TV shows, videos, or movies, most likely found on the internet, where couples are either in or talking about being in a sexual relationship. Your 12-year-old child is further instructed to answer these questions. Name the show and characters. Did they talk about using condoms? Did they actually use condoms? Describe the scene. Do you think they did a good job? Why or why not? You, the parent, are not invited to oversee this homework. Unfortunately, this is not a scenario, but a real-life homework assignment for 12-year-old children. Regarding the lessons from the seventh grade curriculum, I quote Ms. Kong, we did all of them. Your child, who is a minor, has just been assigned to watch content that may very well include pornography. Something tells me you wouldn't want your child doing this homework. In the packet I gave you is the lesson I'm referring to, along with a printout from the Department of Justice's website that discusses obscenity. In it, it states the following. Federal law strictly prohibits the distribution of obscene matter to minors. Any transfer or attempt to transfer such material to a minor, including over the internet, is punishable under federal law. It's possible that some individuals would rather expose and promote inappropriate sexual content to children rather than protect them from it. You might want to pause and consider your role in promoting obscenities in our schools. At the very least, you are now exposed to your community and may have some very angry parents. Or possibly you could be in an, in an awful lot of legal trouble again. Discussing the penalties okay, of such offenses closely. seems like a worthy discussion to have with your attorneys. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Mulligan. I have a daughter at the elementary school and another daughter that would have been affected by this curriculum the next school year had her father and I not already removed her from the system. No words begin to describe my disturbance and the lack of the board's concern and execution of their duties at the time this curriculum was brought to our schools. I witness testimony of how students have responded to this curriculum just this year is disturbing. There has been cowering, shielding, embarrassment, pressuring, taunting, teasing, etc. Now, I have subbed for fifth graders before, but I can't imagine any of my fifth grade students being exposed to sixth grade next year. But this level of response from any group of students should trigger a teacher to question whether the content of any subject matter to be age appropriate material for their students. Also, whether it is the duty of the public system to educate the children to the extent this curriculum goes. If the contents of this curriculum were discovered without any indication that this was from a certified textbook, 
and turned over to law enforcement in the form of emails, texts, prints, printed materials, exchanged between an adult and a student. This would be considered furnishing obscene material, exploitation of minors, acts of indecency without consent, and child molestation. Just because we slap an approved curriculum stamp on, on it doesn't make it right to expose our youth. Where are the studies that show that this curriculum is age appropriate and not damaging to the mental, emotional, social, and sexual development of our children? What about the children who suddenly realize and connect the dots through the behavior they've gone on at home? Are you re-victimizing traumatized students in the name of education? What if the youth subjects of this material actually go out and try it? It's against California law. My other daughter will be not returning to school this fall as I can no longer trust this board with her education or her well-being. Betty Wagner, and I'm, re I'm a retired RN. Um, I uh, reviewed some of the um, curriculum. The eighth grade sexual, sexual orientation curriculum discusses uh, straight, gay, lesbian, homosexual, bisexual, queer, pansexual, and asexual relationships. These groups, these people, no matter who they are, share the one thing in common. They now are more likely than ever to contract an STI, including syphilis and gonorrhea. I hope that when teachers discuss these varied forms of sexuality, you're a member and warn of the AIDS virus which claimed 40 million lives. Please include recent data to help inform the kids of the sexual health crisis they are facing today. Youth 15 to 24 account for half of all STIs and they, they are only one third of our population. One in five people in the U.S. have an STI. The rates have gone up every year for the last seven years. California is fourth in the nation in syphilis cases. Cases have quadrupled between 2015 and 2019. 20 years ago, syphilis was nearly eliminated. Condoms are not effective in the spread of syphilis. Gonorrhea, gonorrhea rates were at historic lows less than 20 years ago. We are now seeing antibiotic resistant strains. Sex ed programs success has always been measured by data. They used data to um, show that pregnancy was improving. They didn't mention anything about STIs. It appears that efforts to decrease STIs have failed miserably. California Health Youth Act was adopted in 2016. It coincides with the surge in STIs in California and throughout the United States. We're in the middle of an STI epidemic and no one, no one is sounding the alarm. Because our young people aged 15 to 24 are affected dispro disproportionately in this epidemic, you have to wonder if the hypersexualization of children through social media could be a contributing factor. Mm -hmm. Whatever the cause, the data is, is not there to support the current sex ed curriculum in the prevention of STIs. Sexual freedom comes with a cost, and tragically, it is our youth who will bear the brunt of, of the current epidemic. Please encourage and promote abstinence it is the only STI prevention that is 100% effective. Thank you, Betty. Jeanette Bachman, Rhonda Erickson, and John Harris. Hi, my name is Jeanette Bachman. I'm a community member, and I appreciate the work that the board does. And I just right into the mic, please. You're having a hard time here. That, yeah. Is that better? Okay. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I appreciate the work that the board does, and I would like to say that I support the education program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Rhonda Erickson, and the topic of sex education in public schools was first introduced in 1913 in Chicago high schools. However, the program was short-lived. During World War I, STDs became rampant among soldiers, prompting the federal government to pass legislation which would allocate <coughs> money to educate soldiers about syphilis and gonorrhea. <coughs> During the 1920s, school began more broadly integrating sex ed into the curriculum. Over the next three decades, sex ed exploded in public schools. 
In the 1980s, the AIDS and HIV pandemic began. By the mid-1990s, AIDS education was mandated in all 50 states. As society progressed, the battle grew between two opposing sides, those opposed to sex education and those promoting sexual promiscuity. <clears throat> Fast forward to today. The framework for the current sex education curriculum comes straight from the WHO, the World Health Organization. States have adopted their guidelines and agenda to form their own curricula, but make no, no, no mistake, this is from the WHO. Thanks to the California Healthy Youth Act, in 2016, sex ed is required teaching in grades 7 to 12 and optional as 6 oh, K through 6. Starting in kindergarten, the emphasis on gender identity, sexual orientation, HIV, and STIs, that's starting in kindergarten. By seventh grade, students are role playing, playing using different genders while deciding which flavored condom is their preferred choice. This isn't about how the body develops anymore, it's about grooming and sexualizing children. Yes, Good evening, members of the board. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is John Harris. I'm an attorney who has been practicing for a little over 56 years, and I had uh, some early expertise in constitutional law. I was going to read to you the three-pronged test that the Supreme Court of the United States created in the case of Miller versus California back in 1973 with the Warren Court, which was a notoriously liberal court for its time. What the case was about, it was in Orange County, I'm sorry, what the case was about, Miller versus California in 1973, was in Orange County uh, where uh, someone was sending out pamphlets unsolicited received by adults uh, with some rather explicit photographs of sexual conduct in them. And they were prosecuted uh, for the crime of distribution of obscene materials. And so the Supreme Court of the United States gave a three-pronged test for what constituted obscene materials. And uh, I was also going to quote to you the federal law concerning distribution of obscene materials, but I was beat to the punch by a lady that I've never met before, Lori Warnick, I think she said her name was. So, but the three-pronged test of the Supreme Court of the United States, and it's still being used today, even though it was back in 1973. Uh, the first test was whether or not the average person applying community adult standards would find the material to be uh, appealing to the prurient interest, which they gave quite a few different definitions for, but it included unhealthy in degrading interest. Personally, I find the stuff that is, has been quoted tonight in the role playing to be unhealthy and degrading. Uh, I think these lesson comments. plans really are. Excuse me, Mr. Lewis. Thank you for your comments. That's the end of your two minutes. We appreciate your comments. Thank you. Marcus Kahn, Irene Cameron, and Carol K. Harris. Gave up. Go ahead and start. <laughs> we might we might have lost a few. Does that mean I get six minutes? Yeah, I wish I could say yes. <laughs> it's right. I wish try. I could say yes. No harm in asking. Okay. Um, a lot of my thoughts. Uh, have please start by introducing yourself. Okay. A lot of my thoughts have uh, already Introduce been uh, spoken. Um, Can we get a quick introduction, this, please? Or, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, my name is Irene Cameron. Thank you. Okay. The curriculum is out there for anyone to see. The reproductive system is as important to learn about as the circulatory system and the digestive system and the respiratory system. Maybe more so at this time when puberty in children's bodies are changing rapidly. Why is this an issue that parents can't address 
without intervention from the board. Okay, opting out. Um, if every parent receives, I don't know how expensive that would be, receives a curriculum their child is going to be hearing and learning about, and they decide to opt out. You know, I don't feel like my child is ready for this information at this age. Fine, opt out. But you know, anybody in this room who doesn't have a child in home street school, myself included, this is kind of none of our business. I mean, I mean, no, it's the parents. It's the parents' business. Okay, the parents look at the curriculum and they decide, and they can opt out. It isn't like you're being forced, you have to do this. Um, no, <laughs> you can opt out and say, you know what, I'm with Bishop Schools, but nah, I'm not going to do that. Or yes, I want it, but it's so important. So keep the parents informed on what's being presented. And, uh, and when, a, when it, it existed, is an op oh, yeah, they all need an opt out form. You give them all an opt out form and you give them the curriculum and you let the parents decide. We don't dictate to parents what they should and shouldn't teach their children. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Uh, Darla Heil, Karen Schwartz, and Bill Albright. Hi, I'm, I'm Darla Heil. Um, and a lot of what I think has already been said tonight, but I'm all for this curriculum, and I really agree with the last lady who spoke, is you have an ability to opt out and make that choice. Please, please use it. Don't try to dictate what other parents um, teach their children. I, I came from a small town in South Dakota. Um, we didn't have sex education. A quarter of the girls in my graduating class were pregnant before they left school. That changed a lot of lives, and it, re it restricted a lot of lives. Um, lots of times the boys who caused it didn't, didn't actually partner with them. So it was a very, very hard thing back in the middle and um, late 60s for that to happen. Um, so I think that we need this kind of education, and I am all for it, and I honestly, I believe you should be able to keep your kids out of it if you don't want them to learn it. That's fine. Do that. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Hi, my name is Karen Schwartz. Thank you so much for your service. I truly appreciate it. Um, I'm a parent of a middle school student here at Home Street Middle School and I was very impressed with the curriculum. It went over in detail um, all aspects of the human body for my 12 year old to understand and he came home with conversation and it sparked just topics that I was really grateful that we might not have had otherwise. Um, so I really want to take the time for Karen for delivering such useful information for a curious inquiring mind and um, bringing this to, um, to our home so we can then further pursue the conversation. So thank you. I'm, I'm Bill Albright. I grew up in Bishop and as a product, K through 12 product, so the Bishop education system, I wanted to a successful career as a research scientist. Um, a half century ago or more, sex ed was taught in Bishop and in your county by my mother. And although it was perhaps a bit embarrassing for me, but it was informative and useful. And I wish she would have included a section on lower back pain. <laughs> To the extent that this is a numbers game, I just have to say that I support the sex education program. I want to thank everybody so far for their comments, but Bill particularly, for just a little bit of levity right there, right? 
in the middle of that, a little bit of laughter is a good thing. Thank you. Christina Ar Arnold, Nancy Thornburg, and Stacy Brown. Hi there, I'm uh, Christina Arnall and I'm all over California and this sex ed curriculum is a strong form in my opinion against child development. I am studying child development as as we speak. I was homeschooled for about five years in about and in biology class I was only taught a very small portion of the reproduction system and the rest was history literally liter sorry I stutter from time to time so sorry no problem <laughs> literally and figuratively and now I'm at 3.91 in my GPA in college I'm close to 4.0 and I'm standing here and standing up for the kids for, for all the children and for their mental, spiritual safety and health, and not for child exploitation. Thank you. I will be talking quickly to meet your two minute mark. Hello, my name is Nancy Thornburg. I am speaking as both a parent and an elementary teacher at Bishop Elementary School. As you know, it takes both the parent and the educator to communicate, work together to best support a child. I appreciate the support that the Bishop Schools have given us as parents to help support our children. My husband and I have attended several events such as social media awareness and drug and alcohol prevention. I appreciate Dave Kalk who spearheaded a campaign to try and get parents more involved as decision makers to help curtail the recurring issues that were happening at dances. Even though the majority of the events we attended had low parental attendance, I appreciated the concerted effort of an administrator or a school to keep us abreast of the challenges that were happening in the schools or were a byproduct of the society we live in. I felt that the school had the best interest of students and parents. At the board meeting in March, I was disheartened to hear about a controversial book called Poet X that was being used in a middle school classroom. There were parent and community complaints that evening about its foul language, inappropriate content, and explicit sexual Nancy, content. I'm gonna interrupt you for just one second. The topic we're discussing right now is the sexual health education. I, I know, it's gonna go together. It's gonna, okay. thank you. Has the school and district remedied this situation? This last month, I was made aware of the new sex ed curriculum that is in the middle schools. The seventh and eighth grade curriculum is completely inappropriate for 12 and 13 year olds. The curriculum is lewd, obscene, and lacks in proper decorum that a person would expect of a human reproduction class. We should not be hypersexualizing kids. We should be guardians of the youth and seek to preserve the innocence of a child and the sanctity of the mind. I am asking that you remove this curriculum from being taught in the schools. I'm also asking that there is no other curriculum being purchased from adv advocates for the youth. I hope that you would thoughtfully consider the comments of the parents and the community to help re-strengthen the relationship between parents and the school district. Don't you love free speech? I love free speech. Don't blow it. Uh, my name is Stacy Brown, and I'm a local family physician. I've been continuously practicing in the Eastern Sierra community since 1997. Um, my experience with prenatal care, delivering babies, treating children and adolescents, including staffing our very own Bronco Clinic here, is particularly pertinent and relevant to any discussion of sexual education in our school system. As a physician, I am compelled by science and facts supported by observable, testable, and reproducible data collection and statistical analysis. As mentioned by other speakers and supported by the vast amount of scientific evidence to date, pregnancy prevention and sexually transmitted infection prevention are well-established outcomes of school-based programs. What we in the medical community have observed over the last 30 years 
is the fact that comprehensive sex education beginning in elementary school and building up through the school years can do other things, including reduce dating and intimate partner violence, build child sex abuse prevention skills, improve knowledge and skills that support healthy relationships, increase understanding of gender and gender norms, and lower homophobia and homophobic bullying. I think that these long-term goals are sometimes lost in the discussion, but remain very, very pertinent in small town, rural environments like ours. I fully support the comprehensive sex education in our schools, and I support the board and the superintendent's decision to continue this positive, productive, and protective program. Thank you. Marty Hornick, Betsy McDonald, and Emily Lanfer. Lanfear. Sorry. I am, uh, true confessions, I am not Marty Hornick, but Marty Hornick asked me to read his letter for him, so I hope that's okay. Um, and I'll, I'll try to make it brief. Uh, he says, I have reviewed the curricula topics and some of the contents of the sex ed program for our students. I watched the graphic content I was alerted to. I think it is critical that you continue teaching our children what they need to know about their bodies, sexuality, responsible sexual activity, and natural sexual development. Bringing such knowledge and acceptance of normal and natural topics that certain groups want to hide away and make taboo is important and will improve student health and our greater community health. The graphic content video, which helps students, especially males, understand what's happening when they become erect, whether wandered or not, was a creative way to teach about a natural and sometimes embarrassing phenomenon. Pretending that this does not happen to every young male, or worse, making them feel self-conscious or like a sinner about getting a boner, can cause self-doubt, anger, frustration, and unhealthy emotions. <laughs> Same should be said about masturbation, gender issues, and other topics in the curriculum. These materials must be available and discussed responsibly in the classroom. Incidentally, there is nothing graphic about an ill, <laughs> I'm just going to skip a little bit uh, in the interest of time. The evidence is irrefutable that a comprehensive and inclusive sexual education curricula reduces teen pregnancy and abortion rates, protects our children from sexually transmitted infections, and helps our students to understand their own personal gender issues. Uh, I realize that some of the board may sympathize with parents who feel that they don't want their children to be exposed to comprehensive education. But I'd ask you two things. First, do you think those children are not being exposed to irresponsible, inappropriate, incorrect, harmful, and yes, graphic information every day through their smartphones, computers, internet, fellow uneducated students, social media, and more? Secondly, as a school board member, do you see your role is to improve access to comprehensive education in schools, or do you feel it's the board's role to limit the availability of educational materials? Thank you very much. Thank you. I am who I say I am. <laughs> uh, I'm Betsy McDonald. Um, many of you know me, uh, former uh, retired principal. I was also an, um, an educator, high school and middle school. I'm just going to talk to the board uh, because I'm not going to change anybody's minds in the room, I'm sure. Um, but before I was all that, and so I've worked with teens for a long time. Uh, I was a health educator for Inyo County Office of, uh, no, just Inyo County Public Health Department with a program called Enable Education Now and Babies Later, again, about 35 plus years ago. Um, and the reason that the Public Health Department got the grant was because Inyo County had the highest rate of teen pregnancy in the state. So we got a lot of money to be able to, um, to implement this program in middle school. It was an abstinence based program, not an abstinence only. So of course there was controversy, um, but the, in order to receive those monies, 
um, we had to, uh, the middle school had to do sex education and there was no sex education going on at all in the middle school. So they implemented that because the program that I ran was about relationships, uh, how to postpone, that sort of thing. And it was about, um, uh, yeah. So, so they got their sex education uh, from before my program came in. The thing that has stuck with me, and again, this was many, many years ago. A, there was no internet at the time. But the kids' questions were very sophisticated, particularly in Bishop. I remember, I was not going to say this, but everybody else has been talking specifically. But I had a question in Bishop Middle School about mutual masturbation. And I'm like, oh, geez, OK, what do I say? Because I've got to stay within the curriculum, right? So you figure out how to respect the question. And, and uh, because we're trained educators, and we uh, care about kids, and we try to stay within the curriculum. Um, anyway, you learn how to do that. And I just want to say that uh, <laughs> the districts in this county are so lucky to have in your county Office of Education, Alyssa and, um, Karen. Karen. I love Karen. <laughs> I'm getting old. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I mean, my gosh, what an experience. Oh, time. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> Not a fan of mics, but I'm going to give it a go. Um, uh, I appreciate this opportunity to come together as parents, grandparents, community members. Um, I'm going to try to stick to the script because some of you know me. I'm not short on thoughts or opinions, so I'm going to try to get through this. Um, my name is Emily Lamphere. Uh, my youngest daughter is no longer attending public school, so you might say we've already opted out. Um, the social agendas being pushed via sex ed, assigned reading, virtue signaling, are reminders that we made the right decision. I still feel our schools are not safe. I do not believe any person in this room is interested in the removal of a sexual health curriculum. Um, if you know me, I'm all about information and education. Um, I do find many aspects of the sexual health curriculum to be unnecessary and, and inappropriate, especially for middle school students. We're talking about 11, 12 year olds, 13 year olds. They're still children. Um, they have enough to navigate with all the emotions and hormones of adolescence, uh, highlighting colors and flavors, role playing, this is a tone of condoning inappropriate behavior, not trying to prevent it. Um, some comments tonight have highlighted that statistics are low and that shows positive results, but that info doesn't address what we do not see. Um, I'm convinced encouraging sexual activity at this age um, translates to youth burdening themselves with unnecessary shame, guilt, and regret. Self-love, self-respect, self-worth should be emphasized. Honoring your body and spirit is something sacred and a gift not so easily given shouldn't be such a foreign concept. Um, all this emphasis on gender identity, labels, language, casts doubt amongst kids that are already naturally curious and maybe confused, which is normal. Um, it is irresponsible for adults to be capitalizing on how impressionable our children can be. I ask you to wrap that up, please. That's oh, been two minutes already. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, I say we need to be focusing on opting in, not opting out. That's a setup. Thank you for your comments. Oh, yeah. I like that. Sarah Malloy, Kevin Daniels, and Cynthia Minky. Minky? I'm not sure if I got that correct. Sorry if I didn't. Cindy, and I'm struggling with some laryngitis. But, um, Could you hold that mic just a little bit? I want to thank there you all go. at the board here to be a part mm -hmm. of something that we here in this community are very far apart on. 
very far apart on. And that isn't something that's just growing along in this community, but it's worldwide. And it's within my own family. And um, my goal is stepping back and hearing how far away we are from the center makes me want to create a club to bring our opposites together and reason and understand and respect and understand that the goal here is for our, the lives and the future of our children. I'm a, I'm a mother of three. I have six grandchildren. One is in the high school right now, 14 years old. My kids age from uh, one and a half to 14. And I believe that transparency of our lives is the only way we're going to find a common ground. We can have all kinds of opinions, but the opposites are never going to bring us together. Thank you. My name is Kevin Daniels. Uh, I've lived here for about 22 years, and I don't have any kids, and I have a lot of empathy for all of you guys in this subject. I am a taxpayer. I've been paying taxes, <clears throat> excuse me, taxes since I was 16 to support schools and educators and everybody else, and I'm grateful for the work you do. What I need are good leaders, and that's what we're trying to create, young people that are good leaders and honestly, our leadership right now, state and federal, is not what I would call good. So the goal for me is that we all create good leaders. My sister um, got pregnant at 14, really good sex education classes, amazing parents. As her brother, I was kind of the first one to realize what was going on, and I fielded, like, what are we going to do? And I basically told her whatever she wanted to do is what we would do and I've got a beautiful niece. And my family raised um, another child, uh, my parents did, um, under really stressful conditions. So I can honestly say sex education is extremely important. I feel like we're kind of talking about two different things in this topic. And it's not for me to decide. And again, I have a lot of empathy for everybody. It needs to be done. I wish this community and this room and these people were what had come together to broach this subject versus a state or federal level. I have questions with the state and federal level being involved in parenting, and I would think it would be a really big concern regardless of where you stand about the parenting of your children by state and federal authorities. That is a scary thing for me. Because if you know me, I live my life as an individual across the board. I, my name is on both lines of my paycheck. No one has a hook in me regarding what I make, when I wait, what I make, or how much I work. Thank you very much. Tiffany Lau. I'm Huli Deb and Lynette McIntosh. Um, Tiffany Lau, West Bishop. When, my when I was growing up, my parents were busy running their auto parts distribution business. I was, on, um, I was going along with my father to deliver an order when I needed to use the bathroom. Um, I saw blood in my underwear and Instead of panicking or thinking that I was bleeding to death or had something wrong with me, I just kind of thought, this is something I'm going to have to deal with for a while. <laughs> and I went up to my father after and said, we need to drop by the, we need to get some stuff. And he wasn't, um, and he just nodded, and, or, you know, he wasn't ashamed or anything, they just hadn't had the time to make that conversation with me. Um, so that is why I'm so grateful to have had a sex ed, um, because this happened uh, in the summer before I started seventh grade. And um, I, I, if any people, if any girls can be spared that fear, 
I think it's worth having the option for them to have that education and uh, destigmatizing sexual education and health. Uh, thank you. Hi, um, my name is Can you Anjali. Hold that mic up, please? Oh, my name is Anjali Deb. Try one more time. Just point it towards you a little more. Like this. Oh, up two is it off? Uh -huh. it's, it's off. It's off. Okay. It's off. Battery. Battery stick. It is blinking. <laughs> I could just talk really loud. Oh, we'll take care of you here. We want to make sure everybody can okay. hear. Wow, you're all set, huh? Give a quick round of applause for Levi. Probably good support. Yeah. You can start by introducing yourself. One more right. time. My name is Anjali Deb. I'm a parent and I volunteer at the elementary school. And I have subbed a little bit last year when we were really underwater. Um, I just want to say that I like this curriculum, and I'm not afraid of it. I think that um, I can understand. We protect our children. We want to keep them safe from everything. We don't want them to be doing anything that's in this curriculum. Or at, we just want them to be OK all the time. But we have to teach them about the world that's full of these things. And I'm not afraid of it. And I'm not afraid that my children will be harmed by it or uh, degraded by it. It's information that they need. And it's giving them license to talk about stuff that some people want them to feel ashamed about. And there's no shame in talking about your body, understanding the world, and your relationship with other people. So thank you. Thank you. Science. 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 My name. Oh, is it still work? It's still not working. We have some curriculum signs out in the audience. Could you please raise them while they get my uh, mic? I want a mic that I can talk in, please. Get your signs up. Upside, you're upside down. Put them out there. Turn them around. This is curriculum. Look at all these uh, things here. Well, my mic is ready. Okay, great. I'm actually going to go ahead and have you put those signs down. Willful distraction of our meeting here is out of order. Well, it's out of a curriculum. It's a, time, it's a chance yeah. for you to speak to us and address okay. us at the board, and we are definitely grateful for you sharing your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. He's getting me a new one. Testing, yes, my name is Lynette McIntosh. I agree with so many things that have been said out there. I had a whole list of things to read out of a curriculum. Many of them have been said. I totally agree that uh, for opting in and opting out, but I think our parents have been opted out of everything. They yeah. need copies of the curriculum in their hand to read and review so that they can opt in. It shouldn't just be a general, you're going to get the class or not. The parents need a choice. Right. They need a choice. They need to read the curriculum. They need a copy in their hands. Claudia, did you read it? Did anybody read it before tonight? I've been going through it for six weeks. That's how long. I have two beautiful grandchildren that were teenage pregnancies, and I wouldn't trade them for anything. Amen. And I'm sure a lot of people in this room have it. But I'm just wondering how appropriate this information is. It's pretty graphic. Close your ears if you're sensitive. This is a, an exercise that they do. All students get uh, information on a card in an envelope, and there's directions to putting on condoms. And I don't know if they talk about flavored condoms or regular condoms. I guess they talk about that, too. But these are the uh, instructions. Check expiration date on condom. Have erection. Take condom from the wrapper. Put condom right side up on the head of the penis. Pinch the tip of the condom. Roll the condom down the penis. Begin your intercourse. Ejaculation. Withdraw penis from partner. Holding condom at the base. Remove the condom from the penis. And by all means, throw it away. How many of you in this room want your child taught that graphically without you there? I would rather have my husband teach my children. They are pretty good young men, and I don't think the school needed to tell them this. 
I'm all for parents, but we have not been informed properly. Um, it's really hard to not be informed, and that's the problem. Parents are uninformed. They're not given the information that they need to make the decision for themselves to opt in or opt out. Amen. Wayne Crosdale, Carla Spencer Napolese, and Marcy Waller. Wayne Crosdale, King and Priest after Melchizedek. Let's go, King Jesus. <laughs> direct from the curriculum, direct. Here's a lesson designed for 13 year olds, eighth grade. Lesson STI Smarts question. Here's the question Which one is the riskiest when talking about STI? Here are some of the answers the teachers are providing directly from the curriculum. Oral sex, answer. Performing oral sex on another 13-year-old, meaning mouth to genitals or anus. Condoms offer extremely effective protection against most STIs. Having unprotected sex of any kind carries high risk for STIs. With oral sex, the 13-year-old performing oral sex is at higher risk because their mouth is coming into the contact with the other 13-year-old's genitals. Another example, 12-year-old, 7th grade homework. Pregnancy website hunt. Homework lesson eight through seven. Question, answer the questions below using any of the following three websites. Be sure to include the link to where you found the information. Planned Parenthood is one of the school provided websites 12 year olds are required to go to to complete the assignment. This is supposed to be a link primarily for pregnancy information but the first tab you see on the website is labeled sex. Then the pregnancy tab is way lower. Here's what is on the sex tab that the 12 year olds were guided to and have complete access to and which can be curiously selected first. What's oral sex? Going down, eating out, blow job, these are all names for oral sex. Using your mouth to stimulate another 12 year old's genitals. Some 12 year olds like oral sex and others don't. Some 12 year olds like giving oral sex but don't like getting it. Some like getting it but not giving it. All of this is totally fine and normal. It's up to you to decide what you're comfortable with and let your 12 year old know. What's anal sex? Anal sex means penis and anus, butt intercourse. Some 12 year olds enjoy anal sex and some 12 year olds don't like it at all. Either way, it's perfectly fine. If you don't like it or don't want to try it, it's it's not okay for someone to pressure you. Sex should feel good and be comfortable for both 12 year olds. Anal sex can hurt if you're not relaxed and don't use lubricant. The anus doesn't make its own lubrication like the vagina does, so using lube helps the penis or a sex toy go in the anus easier. Keeps the condom from breaking. Listen to your 12 year old body. If anal sex, this is grooming. Showing 12 year olds how to insert sex toys in their anus with the right lubricant is not fine and normal. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. Hi, uh, my name is Carla Spencer Napolis. Um, I went to school here. <laughs> um, I had Rosie as my teacher for a couple of years. Um, and I just think of the world. I grew up here, and I think for most of the adults in the room here, it is really shocking. Um, when we think of ourselves as 11 and 12 year olds and what it was like for us as 11 and 12 year olds and what we knew in our, I mean, for me, what I knew growing up in a small town, um, none of those topics he just mentioned are things I even knew existed at that age. However, things for my son who went to the same school were very different and I'm deeply grateful for the sex ed program that was here for my son as a seventh grader. He started here as seventh grade. Um, what my son, I'm a late adopter on tech. My son did not have a smartphone for, I think he was the last kid in his whole school. Good. He still had the little flip phone forever. My main concern was my son um, encountering things that were not age appropriate for him. So I delayed forever, much to his terrible embarrassment. Um, but I came to find out pretty quickly, he was being exposed to those things through peers. Um, and I had no control over that, and I know all of us as parents find that very uh, upsetting and very unsettling that our child is viewing things that we do not think are morally correct. Um, so I am very grateful that we had a sex ed program for my son so he could get correct information 
Um, we still, he's 20 years old now, we still have conversations based on what he learned through that program. Because these things that we find so deeply uncomfortable and so inappropriate for our children, they're learning them. And I want my son to have the information to help him understand these things he's learning way earlier than I ever wanted him to learn. So thank you for supporting sex education in our schools. Sorry if I uh, don't get his name correct. I can't read it. Uh, the last name, well, Gina Steinhoff. Steinhoff? And Lisa Johnson. And uh, Hillary Granham. Can you call those again? We couldn't hear you. Gina Steinhoff, Lisa Johnson, and Hillary Granham. Granham? Granham. Granham, thank you. Hi, my name's Hillary Granham, and um, well, at Dennis, don't, now you can really hear me. <laughs> Anyways, I am, I believe in sex education for my children. Can I've had four children, I've had four children, and I remember when, do you remember when, when we were kids? The you people that are my generation? Over. Thank you, Levi. We never had sex ed. And look at how many, we always giggle over the, the football player getting the cheerleader pregnant, and we didn't know anything about it. You know, we didn't know how it happened. I remember with my girlfriends, we thought we laid next to a man in bed and we got pregnant. I, knowledge is power, and our kids need to know this. And if you, I understand, you don't want to know it, then do you have TVs? Do you have computers? Do you have internet? You better get rid of all of them, because our kids are learning more things that we, they don't need to learn on the, on the electronics than what they're learning in school. And I think if you want to opt out, that's your choice. But why should I have my daughter have to opt out? Because they're not teaching anymore because you don't want it in the schools. And I think that everybody has a right to what they want, but we also have a right if we want our children to learn it, they should learn it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Gina Steinhoff, and I had no intention of speaking tonight, so it's pretty rough. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for your jobs here. I don't envy your positions by any means. Um, one of the things I'd like to point out um, are phenomenal lower pregnancy rates. Where 2019 to 2021, our children were locked up at that point. So, of course, they would be a lot lower. Um, also, the Advocates for the Youth, the program that is being utilized currently. Um, on their website it says, they are deeply proud to work with a network of young people across the country, including in North Carolina, who are working to ensure everyone has access to the abortion care they need when they need it. This curriculum is actually developed by a pro-abortion group. Yeah. I am not opposed to sex education. I'm a fan of sex, when freely given to the right person, it is the greatest gift you can have. But these children need to be taught appropriately. Um, I also am not a parent. However, I did have the privilege of working in surgery for over 20 years. One of the scariest places I was was on a Sunday, we were called into a case, and it was for a potential hysterectomy on a 15-year-old. Yeah. STDs are rampant right now. Um, someone was talking about it earlier, one in five people Look at your neighbors. If you don't have it, someone in the same row does. Men do not know typically if they have um, HPV. It's a thousand dollar test to find out if you're positive or not. Um, I worked with an ENT surgeon, the chief of surgery at New Mexico, and was talking to him about some of the procedures. His biggest concern was throat cancer. He said it's so prevalent among doctors and lawyers and everyone else, and to treat throat cancer, they would actually cut the jaw in the middle, open it up, they have to operate as deep as they can in the throat to try and resect the cancer, then they wire it closed. So for six to eight weeks, everyone that has throat cancer has to walk around with their mouth wired shut. Teach Please these kids, but teach more importantly, let, let the parents choose what the kids are learning. 
give them the education, you see what happens when you show parents the truth. Amen. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lisa Johnston, and I am a parent. Um, I want to thank the board for listening to the community on this issue, taking the time and, and letting us speak. Um, I think that a big misconception is that a lot of us don't want sex ed. That's not true. I think for me personally, a lot of <laughs> a lot of the stuff was really great in the curriculum, but there was a lot of stuff, probably less stuff, um, that I didn't think was appropriate. Um, when I think of my kids at, you know, as sixth graders, I know my children, and I think that there's a lot of stuff that was too advanced, that they were not ready for. So I don't think that both sides are really ever going to agree. Um, so I'm trying to propose something that is more of a middle ground. This curriculum that we're currently using is a all or nothing. And it's not a one size fits all. So I think that we need to look at adopting a curriculum that has sections that you can opt out of instead of you get it or you don't because I believe it's very important, but there's also a lot of stuff that I don't agree with. Um, so, and I think that there should also be um, a more thorough opt-out procedure so that the parents are aware and also that the board approves the curriculum and is able to look at it and actually approve it. Yeah, so if there's a section that I think is too advanced for my child, I should be able to opt him out of that, but still let him receive education on the other stuff, because it's very important. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Edward Davis, Amber Morgenstein, Morgenstein, I think, Heather Boone. to be the bad guy, but I'm going to be the bad guy. And I hope I make a lot of you parents and educators uncomfortable because you need to be uncomfortable. The age of consent in California is 18 for a reason. And according to California State uh, Penal Code, all sexual activity under the age... You want me to wait for two minutes? I can, I can fit this into two minutes. So right, you can, I'll let a few seconds go. Go ahead, go ahead Eddie. According to the criminal code of our state, all sexual activity in minors under the age of 18 is a criminal offense, punishable of up to one year, three years, or eight years in prison or county jail, and fines. You can look this up for yourself, but I'm sorry, you're just ignorant if you don't know this. And many of you are ignorant. Furthermore, it's not just sexual intercourse that's listed. The criminal code lists in uh, Code 288, that uh, lewd acts with a minor covers a broad base of sexual activity amongst minors. And minor on minor, just so you know kids, minor on minor sex is a criminal offense. You can go to jail also. And parents, let's stop criminalizing the girls, please. You, you know what, let's send some of these, I don't want to use foul language, but I'm, I'm, I want to. Let's start sending some of these boys who need to be taught how to respect other people and have some self-control how to wait. I'm going to keep going. This is a connect, criminal if you offense. Could, if you could connect to our curriculum. Now this is connected to the curriculum. All right. These are the these are the pertinent uh, these are the pertinent points you need to know. Educators could face jail time for this material, and parents can bring an action actionable criminal case against many of you personally. And I would suggest that they do that if this doesn't change immediately. Second, the school district could face hundreds of thousands of dollars in fiscal fines and lawsuits based on the mental and sexual abuse associated with this curriculum and the things that are being taught in this classroom. Third, <clears throat> California Ed Code is subordinate to state criminal law. Make no mistake, it is subordinate to federal law. You are not protected because Ed Code says it's okay. The criminal code will stand above, all right?
Hi, my name is Heather Boone, and I am the parent of a high school student here in Bishop. I support the teachers, the staff, the board, the sex ed curriculum as it stands in its entirety, and ultimately, I support that all children receiving that information on how to protect themselves and respect themselves now and also in the future. If you want to keep your kids in the dark, that's no problem. Opt out, problem solved. I'm Amber Morgenstein. I am a parent. Um, thank you to the board for hearing everyone. Thank you to the physicians in the medical community who have taken their time to be here. I just want to say that I am in support of the curriculum. Yes, I did read it. I know it's not for everyone. And if you want to opt out, opt out. Robert Atley, Emily Sims, and John Vallejo. My name is Robert Atley. Um, my daughter, Kendra, wrote a book in Bishop Miracle Country. She refers to me as the beanpole. I don't get any respect. Thank you. School, you know, superintendent and the school board. Uh, this is a huge job. Josh, you're sitting at the head of the table on my side, but thanks for the work, Kathy, other board members. I really respect everybody for coming in here tonight and having opinion. I have opinion. It'll reflect when I finish here. And it's really simple. Bishop, California, I moved here. 1982, 40 years, I'm almost a local. <laughs> Bishop, California, small town, big backyard. Bishop, California, small town, big hearts. Bishop, California, small town, big open minds, means education. Hi everyone, my name is Emily Sims and I'm here because I want to talk about the curriculum and my experience with sex education. Um, I was taught thoroughly about sex education in high school and junior high school. Um, I still, and I have absolutely wonderful parents and a support group and um, knew right from wrong, went to church every week growing up. Um, I still chose to have sex and got pregnant and I have had the best gift I could ever have in my life. Um, and I'm saying this because this is about what the actual curriculum is. We all know and I believe we all want our children to know how the reproductive system works and um, how to have safe sex and um, how to avoid STDs. But we've all heard the statistics already that the STDs and pregnancy rates have only gone up. Now, what, what I want you to know and research yourself, don't just believe this from me, is that you know I got pregnant, but I had three other friends who got pregnant too. And they all were taught too and good parents but they all had abortions. What I'm saying is that there's a, there's a lot of abortions that have been, out, have been happening. It's not about what, um, whether or not to teach these children about right or wrong or whether to, but it is true. I have three jobs. One of my jobs, I hear things on the intercom. I literally, when I hear these things on the intercom, I'll, I'll repeat them in my head. I have plenty of th other things to think about, but I want you to think about that, please. Good evening, board. My name is John Vallejo. I'm a father of two uh, children who one is currently in the system and one will be in the school system very shortly. Um, what an exciting thing to have your kids grow up and to help mold them into. Maybe hold that up just a little bit more. What an exciting thing to have children that you're raising to help raise them into people that you hope are good, healthy, happy.
happy leaders in the community and participants in the community as well. Um, I could give you my opinion on the curriculum. I could be on one side or the other. I'm not sure that's my role here tonight. I'm not sure that's the role of any particular parent here tonight. Why would you listen to me over another parent? I think you all have a job, and that's to hire smart, competent professionals to help do to, to help create curriculums, to help ensure that the curriculums are compliant with what we're legally required to comply with as a school district, as educators, and. I think you've done that in really good, with regard to hiring professionals to create these curriculums and to develop them in a way that complies with what we are required to do. And if we have done that, great. If you don't believe we've done that, then we should look at the process by which the curriculum was created. If there's an issue with the curriculum, let's look at the process. Maybe you need to look at the who you've hired because you don't agree with uh, their decisions. Maybe you agree with their decisions, but my particular personal opinion on whether this should be taught or that should be taught, I'll make that with respect to my own child or children. I'll pull them out if I don't like it, I'll teach them the way I believe they should be taught if I don't like it, or I'll agree with what's being taught in the class and I'll let them uh, be exposed to it in the classroom that way. So uh, I just wanna say that I think the process, personally I think the process is the most important point here tonight and if your board is comfortable with the process by which you arrived at the curriculum, you should move forward with the curriculum, and parents will have the option to either let their children be taught or to teach them themselves. Stephen Machovi and Oneida Walters. And tell me your name. Um, no, was it for this topic or did you want to put comment? Oh, yeah, comment. Did you want to comment? Did you want to comment on the sex, sexual? Why don't you come up as well then? You can be our third. Hello, board. Um, <laughs> are we starting? So first, I want to thank you guys for all your service. I am, uh, my name is Stephen Mahobi, I live in the community. I want to thank you guys for your service. I know it's uh, definitely a thankless job in many, in many cases. And um, what I would like to point out is, um, yes, I've gone over the curriculum. The curriculum, there's been a lot of talk here about sexualizing children and um, how this is sexualizing them. But I'd, I'd like people to consider, are we infantilizing our children? We like to, when a lot of speakers came up here and they started speaking, when they were young, when they were hitting puberty, the average age that a girl was uh, getting her first period was between 12 and 13. Nowadays, it's between five, or between nine and 11. It's true, look it up. And so you can imagine a fifth grade girl who has not had any sort of sexual education because no offense to some of these parents, like you're pretty, you've made it pretty clear that you don't think uh, uh, someone at that age should be, should be learning about the bodies and those sorts of things. Not only that, but if I were having an issue, no offense, I wouldn't be comfortable coming to you, given the speech that you guys are giving here and how you're speaking out uh, against these sorts of curriculum. And so I do think for some of these topics, which are very uncomfortable for the parents, it, is, it does fall on the school to give them the opportunity to learn. And again, as has been said over and over and over, um, if you don't want your child to take it, you can opt them out. We are a country of liberty and freedom, thanks to the service of many of our, of our residents, and that is your right but I don't think you should um, throw away the, um, the curriculum based on that, so. That was pretty good, that was a pretty good comment. Hi, my name is Oneida Walters and I'm a community member, but I'd like to come up here and offer a different perspective. It was just 12 years ago that I was actually in this auditorium learning this type of curriculum. And frankly, at the time, 
it was really helpful. It gave me a lot of like answers that I needed uh, and that I couldn't get from my father because frankly, he was too uncomfortable to broach the subject with me, which whatever, that's a side thing. But the fact is like the stuff that I couldn't learn from home, I actually got here at school and it was helpful. And yeah, I learned it. I had decent parents. I'd say they're decent and I don't have kids. So I think that's a point in the positive direction. And also, frankly, I feel like everybody's been so flustered and frustrated tonight. And I think at the end of the day, we all care about each other. We're all in a community together. And I think that it's going to be okay. So thank you guys for what you do. And thank you for whatever you decide. That's it. My name is Pam Spector. I grew up here. I went to K through 12 here. And... Um, I'm up here because I'd like to read a brief statement on behalf of George Lazito, former county superintendent, Carrie Lazito, 30-year veteran biology teacher at Bishop Union School District. They support the current sex education and would like to thank the school board and the staff for all their hard work on behalf of the students. And on my behalf, I'd like to say thank you to all of you too, because I can't imagine doing this job. But um, as I said, I went to school here. We had no sex education. Um, I, am I would be embarrassed to tell you the questions I had when I was 12 that I didn't get answered anywhere but from kids on the street. And as you know, those answers are never accurate. And if someone approached me and said, you know, you can have sex and then jump up and down in the sperm will be confused. I might have believed them, but <laughs> that one didn't occur to me. Anyway, I really appreciate and support this program. I think as um, evidence-based, pregnancies have gone down and I think that's a great thing. So continue with the great work. Thanks. That brings us to the close of our public comments. I'd like to start off by just saying thank you to everybody. I really appreciate all your points of views, and I know that we'll all listen carefully, and we'll do our best to consider those as we, uh, as we discuss and then move on to the vote. I also want to say, just as a Bishop Community member, I just feel like I'm so proud of us. Right? This is hard work. It's hard work, especially when we stand on different sides of these issues. But the way we're engaged in that dialogue, and we'll continue that now, again, it's good work, and we have much to be proud of for what we've done over the last few hours. At this point, I'll open up. Um, wrong pile. No, no, you can go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about Sorry. We have one more in the wrong pile again. So we, we've got our, our last closing comment. I'm sorry. That's awkward. It's, uh, my name is Lisa Coleman, and I've been a parent in this community since 2004. My kids have been part of the public schools since 2009. My oldest is now a sophomore at UC Berkeley. I have a child who will be entering ninth grade this fall, and he's very excited to go to college as well. My experience raising children here has been overwhelmingly positive, thanks in great part to Bishop Public Schools. <clears throat> I've volunteered in classroom for hundreds of hours over the years, and I've observed firsthand the most dedicated and caring teachers. My interaction with administrators in the front office, from the secretary to the principal, was always and is still always overwhelmingly positive. <clears throat> We have felt nothing but support for our children over the years, and I certainly don't have time to get into the specifics. And even though I'm reading, my voice is quivering. One thing I wanted to say at this time, also generally speaking, is that over the past 20 years, we have weathered controversies in our community, from gun carrying laws to testing and now to this. Certainly we don't always see eye to eye, and certain issues bring this to light. But ultimately we do see eye to eye and that we want the best for our kids. Interestingly, however, is that priority is often clouded in hypocrisy. We say it's the best for our kids, but really it's what we want for ourselves. Is it so bad that our kids learn about different kinds of people in the world out there, even though it's not representative of what we see here in Bishop? Is it so bad that our kids learn about the overwhelming topic of sex in a safe and non-judgmental space. I suppose if your answer is yes to either of these questions, then it's time to think about how they'll navigate the world when you're not around to help. 
Also, if the answer is yes to either of these questions, why not simply opt out and keep your child at home? So those of us who believe in this curriculum can have access to it. I thank the school board sincerely and wholeheartedly for allowing this kind of education, one that opens my child's mind to the world out there. Thank you. And this does bring us to the end of our public comment or just um, for our discussion and action item right here, 6.1. Thank you. Um, at this point, we'll engage in board discussion. There will be no questions from the audience. At the end of that, we'll move toward move to a vote. So um, what we are considering here tonight is to continue the use of the rights, respect, and responsibility sexual health education curriculum. Do I have any board member comments or questions or discussion? I do have a question. Uh, I don't know if I can address myself to Karen Khan. Yeah. And, um, I would like to know if you are really using that video that everybody's commenting on. Oh, sorry, I just took it from It's okay, I can talk really loud. Um, Josh, I, can you pass that back? And for our board discussion, the most important is that we hear each other, so if we can just do our best to talk out, we'll be just Well, fine. I agree with you, but I think they should deserve to hear it. I well. understand that. So the video that was mentioned had been used in the past, but not for the last two years. It was um, part of the curriculum in the past um, as a supplemental material and is not part of this curriculum. One more question. Mm -hmm. uh, are you doing the role plays in the classroom? So um, the role plays were not done as role plays. They were handed out and the relationships in the role plays were discussed at a group level okay. at the whole class um, I and to be clear I never make anybody participate ask questions or raise their hand or participate in anything they don't want to participate in. Okay. Sorry. one more question okay have you come across any students who have suffered some social emotional mental disturbances because of the uh, Curriculum. Not that I'm aware of. I do see kids squirm in their seats and put their heads down and get embarrassed by the topic. But to be honest, I find that happens when I talk to adults about the topic as well. <laughs> Thank you. Board members, other questions? I have another question for Karen. Um, is, uh, is abstinence taught? Is abstinence part of this curriculum? Absolutely. That if you, um, you couldn't see it on the slide. I know. I, I, the, the last bullet point in the um, tool that, that was utilized included abstinence. Um, I, throughout all three years in which I have these children, um, I speak to them about the idea that the only way to protect yourself from pregnancy is abstinence. And the only way to protect yourself against sexually transmitted diseases is abstinence and not being naked with someone who might have lumps or bumps or sores. So yes. Do you define abstinence as well as like no oral sex and other stuff? Is that not vaginal? I, I define abstinence as any sort of sexual contact that involves your genitals. Any other questions for Karen at, at this moment? Uh, I, I'll, I'll go into some of it. Um, <clears throat> Pornography's been mentioned a lot tonight, and mm -hmm. you had mentioned it in class when I was there with the sixth graders. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to, I kind of want to address kind of what Virginia said as far as seeing anyone um, uncomfortable, mm -hmm. I'll say. I think we're going to use the mic up there. Yeah, you having trouble hearing back there? Yep. Give it a go. If it becomes awkward to pass back and forth, then we're going to go ahead and we'll, we'll figure this out. Yeah. Um, I got the chance to sit in uh, two classes. Do we get to have two? Sweet. You don't have to see me. So I got to sit uh, in two classes um, and this go around um, for 
sex ed because the previous grades were before I was back on the board. Um, and my first time sitting in was a Tuesday, which would have been your day two mm -hmm. with them, correct? Um, and I sat in the back and I'm looking across the classroom and there are three little girls that I'll never forget. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm a protector, so I might get uh, either angry or emotional. Um, they put, as we're discussing, um, not we, as, as you're teaching, there's uh, body parts um, with male and female in mm -hmm. positions so you can see anatomy. It's not photos, everyone. It's a somewhat of a drawing that you might see mm -hmm. in a book. Um, I, I watched these three little girls put their head in their in their coats. Two of them had coats. The other one didn't. They put their head in their hand, head in their hands. I wanted to pick those little girls up and take them out. That's not my place. I'm not their father. But I could see their innocence being taken from them. And I'm not saying that that's you personally, Karen. I'm saying that that's this curriculum or parts of it, because I do agree in some of this is good, because the common misperception I think tonight is that um, those that are speaking against this curriculum are outwardly against sex ed, and that is not the case. Um, so that'll lead me to my question, but I did want to address that. Thank you for bringing that up, Virginia. Um, you had mentioned briefly pornography, and it was kind of clear which kids, typically the boys, had already been witness to it quite a bit, and we're talking about sixth grade. So uh -huh. um, sixth grade might be a older, I'm sorry, a 10-year-old to 11-year-old, correct? So um, I was pretty uncomfortable in there, you guys could imagine. Um, do you ever teach the effects, the negative effects of pornography? If it, well, first off, pornography is not part of the curriculum. Right. If it is brought up by a student, um, what I, my general tone and message to them is that pornography does not represent sexual acts that people who are in committed, loving relationships do with one another. That pornography is for entertainment purposes, it is not real life, and it does not represent what you will experience later in life when you choose to have sex. And just to address those three little girls, um, it is not my place as a teacher to change my curriculum because of their uncomfortableness. Their parents decided they could stay. And we might see that differently. There, you see uncomfortableness, I see their innocence being taken from them. And that's heart-wrenching. <clears throat> so, pornography is a big deal. We all have these stupid things. Um, you don't have to agree with me, but no, no child should have one of those. Um, and mine don't. I encourage a lot of folks, and, and Steve just said, you know, a lot of, all this is tied to sex ed, okay? Um, go to uh, the new drug, I believe it's the new drug, dot org. Uh, I want to get into some of this. The reason I believe that this is sexualization is because when kids become uh, numb to a lot of this stuff, it's easier for them to be violated. It's easier for them to be groomed. So let's talk about pornography. I believe it should be taught the damages. There's physiological damages. There's psychological damages, emotional and spiritual and physical damages, watching, being addicted to pornography, especially at that young age. Uh, Karen, is that accurate? You just yes or no. Sorry, I turned the mic off. Um, yes, I, I, I believe that that anybody who's accessing porn at an age in which they're not, their brains are not fully developed can have negative consequences by that. Okay, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and limit your answers just to those that have, are germane to our, our curriculum. And you made it really clear earlier to us that pornography is not part of our sexual health ed curriculum. So that's correct. that wouldn't be part of our discussion tonight because that's not anything we're deciding on. And John, unless what you're saying, and we understand this, is that you're suggesting our sexual our sexual health curriculum is pornography. Whatever m makes you understand that this is all connected, I, well, you can interpret that how you want. I'm just asking for your position. Is our sexual health curriculum pornography? Well, like you heard tonight, and I've read it myself, it does encourage children to go watch videos at home and come back and report back on that. Is that not correct? Did you read that? 
I did. Okay. So it's connected. Thank you. No, no, but, but I still don't can, understand. Can I answer, can I answer that just for a split second? Yeah, go ahead. Um, this curriculum has been done one year now, and none of those homeworks were assigned to any child at Home Street Middle School. I'm, I'm not sitting here saying that that's not true, but it is here. Okay. So the option is there. And again, I'm not saying that you take advantage of it, but it's there. And I think that, that we can do a better job as a board and a community to bring a better curriculum. And, and let me let me get into that because I think we're gonna waste time bantering back and forth, Steve. It's all connected. Despite the fact that porn can be wildly unrealistic and often glorifies violence, sexism, or racism, one recent survey found that over half of boys, 53%, 39% of girls, reported believing that pornography was a realistic depiction of sex. According to data from SEMrush Traffic Analytic, Analytics Tool, as of May 2021, porn sites received more website traffic in the U.S. than Twitter, Instagram, Netflix, Pinterest, and LinkedIn combined. Teen, I'm going to say it again, teen is one of the most consistently popular porn themes. And research shows that this theme, one, is becoming increasingly popular, and two, includes a portrayal of underage characters. In 2018, 45 million images of sexual abuse, sexual abuse material, sometimes referred to as child porn, were reported, according to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. In 2019, that number jumped to 69.1 uh, 69 million. Today, that's 366 million. Videos or images of child being exploited and or raped. Where's the law? <laughs> the Internet Watch Foundation recently reported that during 2020, as we all know, kids were locked down. Approximately 44% of all child sexual abuse material reported to the IWF involves self-generated material. So that goes back to what I'm talking about is these kids kind of being calloused and numb to this stuff, so then it's just okay for them to put these doggone videos out there. This is a 16% increase from 19 when only a third of reports involve self-generated imagery. Okay, I'll, I'm going to go ahead and keep going. I'm not going to be rude, but I'm going to ignore you. Yeah. Of domestic minor yes, trafficking please, victims who have been forced... Please hold those audience comments. This is a time for board discussion. Of domestic minor trafficking victims who have been forced into porn production, the average age they began being filmed was 12.8. Okay. There's a, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, but I, I was kind of the catalyst to get not me specifically, but parents, myself, the cast, to get this on the agenda, and I believe it's important on, on what the context is, okay? Is there anyone in this room that believes that sex education should just be eliminated outright? No. Josh, this is, a, this is a conversation for us. You okay. Is there anyone in this, on this board that believes that? No. Thank you. So, Steve, I think I can address the board and the public at the same time. Josh, we're almost facing... three hours into a long conversation. You need to bring this home so we understand what you'd like us to know. I get that, but there would be quiet. Two, excuse me. Yeah, two, hours, two hours of listening to the public, and I, I love it, both Absolutely. sides. I thank all of you for coming. You don't have to agree with me, Josh. this is I, why we're here. I understand. And, Josh, what I want to know is how I can agree with you or not. So please help me understand okay. what it is that you're Let trying to Let me get to, to my points, though. Okay. You're doing good. Oh, I'm fine. All right. So I, I wore this hat and I wore this shirt on purpose. This hat says his, meaning that you and I are creating a likeness and image of God. Doesn't mean you have to agree with that, but I'm going to treat you that way, and I expect the same in return. This shirt says this is the hill I will die on, and it has photos of children, yours and mine. I don't care if you agree with me politically or my faith. I will defend your children. Among all the differences in this community, I always thought that protecting children would be a common thread. Sadly, I feel like I'm wrong, I'm mistaken. I hope to be proven wrong. I am not opposed to sex ed, contrary to what probably a lot of you believe. I think a good, healthy sex education emphasis on education can prevent a lot of these data numbers that whatever side is correct. Okay, I'm not ignorant to fact, ignorant to the fact that there are not there are a lot of children out there that don't have the same parental guidance that I did or the same parental guidance that I'm giving my children. Ten years as a cop, I see it every day. 
And so this should be designed for them. Now I get a lot of, there's a lot of folks out there who talk about opt out, opt out, opt out, right? You all can opt out. I believe there's middle ground that you don't have to opt out. And then I think that this board can find it. Okay. What about, and I have a legitimate question, and Katie, you might be able to answer this, or County Office of Ed. What about opt-out options for those who have no parent or guardian? Because we often talk about homeless children, socioeconomic disadvantaged children. What about them? How do they opt out? So every student has a ed rights holder, so it may not be their legal parent or guardian, but we do have some sort of documentation for every student to have a parent figure. And are some of those up, those holders government entities, I, yeah. like HHS and things like that, or is it there someone in family? All individuals. It would never be okay. a department so or agency. Form. Okay. I want to I'm going to move on to policy. Um, I'll get back to some of this. So, so uh, Mr. Uh, Vallejo and I don't often agree on much, but we do on this. Okay, I'm going to go to policy because we're not we're in violation of our policy. 61, 61.11 supplementary instructional materials. You've heard the board talk about that this is supplementary, so it didn't need to be approved. Well, that's wrong. Okay, the first paragraph. Such materials shall be aligned with district goals, curriculum objectives, and academic standards, and shall supplement and not supplant the use of board-adopted basic instructional materials that serve as the primary learning source resources. Okay, we go down. As appropriate, supplementary instructional materials shall meet the criteria developed for the selection and evaluation of basic instructional materials as described in 6161.1. Okay, and I'll, I'll read that por those portions in a second. Move a couple paragraphs down. The board shall select content review experts who possess the qualifications specific in law to review and recommend such supplementary materials. That was not done. The majority of the content review experts shall be teachers who are credentialed and authorized and or authorized in the subject area they are reviewing and the remainder shall include appropriate persons from post-secondary educational institutions school and district curriculum administrators and other persons who are knowledgeable in the subject area. Now, I'm not saying that the county office is not knowledgeable or experts in that, but this was not done by the board. Whenever a district appropriate appropriateness of materials, whenever a district employee proposes to use a supplementary resource which is not included in the approved learning resources of the district, he, she shall preview, preview the material to determine whether in his or her professional judgment it is appropriate for the grade level taught and is consistent with district criteria for the selection of supplementary instructional materials. That employee shall confer with the superintendent or designee as necessary to determine the compliance of the material with district criteria. The primary consideration should be the educational value, appropriateness, and relevance of the materials as well as ages and maturities, maturity of the students. Okay. Now the selection and evaluation of instructional materials, which is 6161.1, which was referenced in the supplemental. The review process. The district's review process for evaluating instructional materials shall involve teachers in a substantial manner and shall encourage the participation of parents and guardians. The review process may also involve administrators, other staff who have subject matter expertise, and students as appropriate. The superintendent, and this didn't finish the print sentence, but um, should check backgrounds and perspectives. The superintendent or, or designee shall present to the governing board recommendations for instructional materials and documentation that supports the recommendation. All recommended instructional materials shall be available for public inspection at the district office. When possible, the district may pilot instructional materials in a representative sample of classrooms for a specified period of time during the school year in order to determine uh, curricular goals and academic standards. Okay, and the last line that I'll, I'll read on this section, to, to the satisfaction of the board, are accurate, objective, current, suited to the needs and comprehension of the district students at their respective grade levels. Um, now I wanna quote Education Code 51933 because that was mentioned as far as sex ed curriculum goes. The very first line under this for general criteria for instruction materials, first line says, are age appropriate. This curriculum is not age appropriate. Right. Second line, are factually and medically accurate and objective. So throughout this curriculum, 
find the first one. I want to say factually, medically accurate. Throughout this curriculum, we want to talk about kids that uh, can identify as one gender or the other. Well, guess what? You're either born a male or female. That's it. Okay. There are portions that talk about sexual and reproductive systems for people who are born with certain body parts and are assigned female or male at birth. And it's important to avoid assuming that all of your student gender identities will match their sexual anatomy. Referring to the people with particular body parts, such as a person with a vulva, will create a more inclusive classroom than female anatomy. How can we talk about science, medical, when we can't even identify what a young lady is? or her reproductive parts. Okay, as an adult, all of you here, this board, your sex life is your business. I don't want to know about it. I don't care. I judge a person by the content of their character. I don't care who you're sleeping with. I don't care the color of your skin. And this should not be pushed on children that are confused. Because let's... I had a, uh, um, this was connected to talking about being confused and identifying as something that you're not. Okay, again, you want to be an adult and do all that stuff? I don't care. As someone mentioned previously, I did fight for freedom for you to go do that. Go do it as an adult. But why do we need to sexualize children? Why children? Why is this pushed from the state and different groups? So this, I was at a wedding reception where a, uh, he was about five or six, we were on the second story floor of a church. He started to crawl out the window. He's going to crawl down the side of the window. I was right there. Both him and his aunt, or I'm sorry, myself and his aunt went and grabbed him. And we asked him what he was doing. He said he was Spider-Man. He was going to crawl out the window. He believed he was Spider-Man and going to crawl down that wall. Why don't we let him identify as being Spider-Man? Because he's going to fall on his face and die. Projecting this stuff on children, allowing them to chop yeah. their penises off, or give them a step, I don't even know the word, <laughs> removing their breasts is child abuse. And someone else said that, I believe that was Eddie. California Penal Code 273A says, any person who under circumstances or conditions likely to produce great bodily harm or death willfully causes or permits any child to suffer or inflicts their unjustifiable physical pain or, keyword or, mental suffering. Here, here. And I'll end with this. Since March 9, 1998, 132,000, I'm sorry, 132 million child sexual exploitation incidents. Since September of 2002, the NCMEC has received over, th like I said, I said that, that number earlier. Just forgive me, there's one more stat that I wanted to put out there. There it is. The number of se uh, child sexual abuse files reviewed by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in 2004, it was 450,000. In 2022, that was 82 million. So I think those that don't agree with me as far as a lot of this stuff, I, I would ask, why, why children? I would ask, and I'll ask, and I'll finish with as far as my proposal to the board. The policy wasn't followed, okay? And like I said, I do agree with Mr. Vallejo. And I believe that we should show an extension of good faith to our community by removing this curriculum. And then we go through a thorough process of selecting a sex ed curriculum that helps students and doesn't sexualize them. policy was followed. I do think this is an excellent curriculum. I don't think it's pornography. 
parents have a right to opt out if they don't like it. I think the parents who do want this program should not be stopped by the parents who do not want it. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, this is yet another meeting where um, the two very different sides, two, a, a lot of opinions are here. And I think that's very enriching. And like Mr. Vallejo said, I think Mr. Vallejo is going to get a lot of uh, mentions today. What, what is the process? What is the correct process? What, what, what is ed coverage? And, and what is our job as board members? So ed code does require us as a district to cover sex ed and to cover very specific um, topics and points. Um, that is one requirement we do have. And correct me if I'm wrong, the requirement is not for the students. That's why they can opt out, right? Um, if indeed a process was, um, another thing I, I want to, to address here is that based on the presentation and the follow-up questions that we did have and a lot of the comments, there, there is a little bit of a gray area with some material that has been removed, some material that might be incorporated to um, comply with um, California Department of Education requirements, or ed code. And I think that's where we need to clean up things and where we need to clarify what, um, what is part of the, how many lectures, 170 lectures or 120 lectures, but you chose 17. I think that we can, we can do a better job at um, clarifying what is it that is being taught? Um, and yeah, provided to parents ahead of time, which, I mean, the Parent Square had the link, the material is there, the opt-out is there. Yes, there's a lot of paperwork that comes from the school, but um, um, other than that, I think that the process is in place. Can it be cleaned up? Absolutely. Can we communicate better? I'm all for that. Um, and I think, you know, we, we, two years ago, everybody was advocating for choice. This is the one time we actually do have choice to participate or opt out. Apart from required HIV AIDS prevention education, public schools are not required to offer comprehensive sexual health education. That's Ed Code 51933. They're also not required to have all three grades in middle school. One in middle school, one in high school. So districts get some flexibility, but the California Health and Youth Act and the California Ed Code are both pretty clear that comprehensive sex education must this, be offered. This is what you sent me. Uh, this isn't the title of it? This is a question and answer guide on California's parental opt out statutes. Mm -hmm. That's referencing Ed Code 51933. That's section 6 of that statement. Am I reading that wrong? I, I, honestly, we went through a lot of documentation, so I can't refer to the policy itself, but I can tell you that in California, we must offer comprehensive sex education. Well, you emailed me, I'm assuming you emailed the entire board, this document. Yeah. But can you read the title? Is May it schools avoid controversy by deciding not to provide any instruction on, on human sexuality. Mm -hmm. So the second paragraph says, apart from this required HIV slash AIDS prevention education, public schools are not required to offer comprehensive sexual health education. 
If schools choose to have sex education classes, they must satisfy criteria set out in California law. So if we choose, then we go to follow. So that the was law. probably written prior to the California Health Needs Act. Let me find the date. You were the one that sent this to me, and that's what I'm not arguing that. Just There's hundreds of pages of things we've been looking over. So the dates of materials I can't reference on top of my head. Shouldn't be told I, I don't see a date on this, but this, this okay. came from, from you. And so what you're concerned with is there, are we in fact required to do this? You're, one, you're questioning that, and that according to this, you believe that we don't need well, to require it. This isn't my belief. This is what I'm reading. Right, but we, all, we also just don't know the date. We don't know the, how correct that is. We've had some information to the contrary, so let's go ahead and add that to the mix of, our, of the data that we're using to make our decisions. I think Virginia had some comments. Um, earlier, we have two little girls who went out at the city to another school, bigger campus, lots of people, and just the expression on their faces of being in a bigger school was just priceless. They saw another world. They only saw the school. They didn't interact with any single person around. Maybe they didn't. What about when our kids, they graduate, they're ready to go to, to college, to other states, to other places, and, and they have to face reality. Have they been exposed to all this sex education that we're trying to implement at schools? It is required. Uh, the world is different now. In the past, we didn't hear a lot about bisexual or all these terms. Right now, where we are right now, we are hearing all of this and we need to learn about it. We need to respect every single individual. And by doing that is by learning. And I do agree, we need to educate. I do agree with Kathy's heart. So just to confirm, the California Healthy Youth Act was enacted in 2016, and it does require comprehensive sex education in addition to HIV prevention. So prior to 2016, things were different, and then as of 2016, it is required. There's the internet hard at work for us, right? <laughs> Here we are in our modern times. I'll share with you my perspectives. I think some of the data we received tonight in our presentation from the, the County Office of Ed clearly outlined some of the benefits and we heard from a number of speakers who talked about the benefits of a comprehensive self, uh, sex health education program. Um, hopefully we're not disagreeing on that. Right? What I've heard on the board so far tonight is not that should we have this or should we not, but is this the right one for us? So I think we can all agree that there are clear benefits for an appropriate sex ed curriculum. And as well, we just heard validated once again that there are state requirements that we need to follow in order to remain in compliance. And so in terms of our why, I'm seeing two different directions. One is beneficial for our students and our healthy communities. And two, we do, it is our obligation to uh, maintain compliance with those requirements. One of the things that we've grappled with over the last number of years is that feeling of powerlessness we have because so much was taken out of our hands locally as an educational legislative body and being happening, happening at the, fate and the state and federal level. What's nice about this right here and this decision we're making tonight is that we get to have some autonomy about what we're choosing to do and how we can move forward. And from what I've heard tonight, that um, there are clear and appropriate guidelines for what needs to be taught in those classes and what is being taught. That it's factually based, that it's unbiased, and it's age appropriate, defined by an external agency so we have a clear understanding of what's meant by that that during this process, the curriculum was vetted by a, a group of consultants that we hired and asked to do this work, and they looked at a number of different curricula out there, select, narrowed that down to five, and from those chose the one that was most appropriate for our learning environment in our community. It was local educators 
who know our community, know the diversity of our families, and who said this is the one that will be a best match for us, as well as being standards-based both at the, uh, at the federal level and the California level. What I'm also hearing is that there's flexibility in the content that we choose to include in the classroom and that our educators who are delivering this, they have leeway about what they deliver and how they deliver it, and they have local choices. They get to decide what's best for our kids. And honestly, I, as a board member, I have bedrock belief in the professionalism, the training, the ability, the commitment, and the integrity of our educators in this community. And so I'm confident they're gonna make a well-informed decision that's gonna keep the best interest of all students in mind. And what we've also heard over the last few years, one of those points of contention that made them so difficult for us was the lack of parental choice, the, the feeling of so many parents are in our community feeling they were, like they were having to abdicate their own choice and what they wanted is best for their kids. And the system that we set up now absolutely empowers parental choice. Where they have the opportunity, yeah. they have the opportunity to yeah. opt in and opt out of that. I like the term that Claudia only used nothing. a little bit earlier. Yeah, only I like the term that, I, that Claudia used a little bit earlier. There are some things we might want to think about cleaning up, right? Yes. I've heard communication, that there's some challenges out there and the parents would like more communication. I can't rattle off all the individual ways this was communicated, but I, w I know there's some frustration out there. So that is something we can look at. I heard a number of parents talk about the opt-out form and some of the content on that opt-out form not being appropriate and feeling like it was not, uh, it shouldn't be in part of, part of that form. We can absolutely look at that and clean that up again. If there's work to be done, we can certainly do that. I don't think that stops us from taking our vote tonight and moving forward with the curriculum we're using. I believe in our why. I see our benefits for our students. I believe in the fact that we have trained, professional, committed educators making those choices locally within the context of our district and our community. And um, I know that we're still maintaining parental yeah, freedom. What about the parents? What about the parents? You've heard more than half, at least one I will ask you for order, right? This is the opportunity for the board to engage in discussion. There's just, there's one more code that I wanted the board to be aware of. I missed earlier. This is Ed Code 212.5. Define sexual harassment. It means unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, and other verbal, visual, or physical conduct of a sexual nature made by someone from or in the work or educational setting under any of the following conditions. And there are four, and I'm gonna read C. The conduct has a purpose or effect of having a negative impact upon the individual's work or academic performance, or of creating an intimidating, hostile, or offensive work or educational environment. I believe that this board needs to keep this at the front of their mind given the fact that this board violated the rights of students in the last three years and had to just settle on that in violation of federal and state law. Okay, so well, um, I have a question for my fellow board members. So, With the, um, the curriculum that we had, we fell out of compliance. Is that accurate or no? I don't know. Uh -huh. You don't know. Okay. Um, <laughs> we are required to, uh, as a parent, my job is to decide what is age appropriate for my child. Right. Absolutely. And it's my responsibility to read that material and to make that decision. As a board member, my job is to make sure that Ed Code is, that we're in compliance with Ed Code. Um, again, I, read, I, I think we can provide information and it is the parent's responsibility and choice to decide what's best for their kid. Katie, how, how can we find out if we are in 
Oh, right, to the Ed Code yeah. in compliance. Have we find out if we are? Mm -hmm. Well, the curriculums that were considered are all compliant. Okay. So the five that it was narrowed down to were all compliant. Are those the only ones that were considered? The, the, the five curricula that we considered were all compliant with our state requirements. Thank you. Is there any other board discussion? Okay, we'll move to a vote. We're voting for the approval here for the continued use of the rights, respect, and responsibility sexual health ed education curriculum. All in favor of item 6.1, say aye. 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 All opposed? No. Any abstentions? No. Motion carries 4-1. Uh, almost 10:15 now. We're going to go ahead and take a 12-minute recess, and we'll come back at 10:25. Um, I hope we get a chance to talk again. Okay, I, I'm sure we will.
again thank you for staying with us this evening um, we are going to mix up our agenda just a little bit because we have a group of students here who's been here for several hours and um, and they've been waiting to present we really want to honor them honor their time and then get them home so it's not too late past their bedtime right 
So um, the second half of the AVID presentation, item 9.1, Anna Camacho, the AVID coordinator and teacher at the high school, is here to present with uh, a uh, number of her students. Okay. There, it's on. So uh, we were unaware that the presentation was going to change, and I texted back and forth with my students and said, look, you guys don't have to stay. And they said, no, we'll stay. And then an hour later, I texted and I said, really, you guys, you don't have to stay. An hour later, I sent another text and said, really, you guys, you don't have to stay. And they stayed. And that's exactly <laughs> what I They really don't need any more introduction because that is really um, what an AVID student is about, advancement via individual determination, where they make the choice to say, no, um, this is important to me and I'm gonna show up and I'm going to uh, make a difference. So our first presenter is Alfred Patterson, and then our second presenter is Riley Powers, and um, they're gonna Briefly look at the slide, but mostly they're going to share their experience through AVID um, at BUHS, um, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th, and there were some dips in there, and they're going to share that with you. Hi there. Um, my name is Alfred, and yeah, pretty much just let it be testament that the reason why I stayed here so long was to just talk about AVID and how important it is to me. Um, as Ms. Camacho said, AVID stands for Advancement via Individual Determination, and that's exactly what I think AVID is. AVID is a curriculum and a family which teaches us, the students, how to become determined and powerful within ourselves and to most of all reinforce our own capabilities to create the future that we want. In AVID, we have, oh yeah, next slide, thank you. This one's, this one's good. Um, in AVID, we have a formulated and integrated system which puts students in groups to discuss and engage in their everyday education and work as well as support them in their everyday lives. We use tutorial groups, grade graphs, which keep, which keep us on top of our grades and hold us accountable for our work ethic, as well as indulge in enriching reading material that teaches us valuable life experiences and confront us with hardships that we'll experience in college and life after high school. AVID is a family. I personally have become closer with some of my closest friends in this family and have had fantastic experiences with them. And honestly, I owe the majority of my positive high school experience to being an AVID, so huge thank you for that. Um, you can go to our next slide. Um, a large part of our AVID experience is the AVID trips where we tour different colleges and discuss the different kinds of scholarship, financial, um, and educational opportunities available to every single student here, um, regardless of who the student is socioeconomically. Um, and to put the impact of AVID into perspective, I come from a poor family who won't be contributing financial support to my college education. I'm the first person in my family to graduate high school, and along with that, I'm the first to pursue a college education. <laughs> So you can kind of imagine that I wasn't exactly motivated or educated about any of the opportunities or anything that I knew could be available to me for my future. Um, being an AVID changed all of this. Um, on last year's AVID trip, I visited Cal State Long Beach, which is where I'll be attending this fall. I will major in criminology and criminal justice. Um, you can go to the next. So this was the colleges that we toured this year. Um, lots of great, awesome places. And by the time we went on this AVID trip just a couple weeks ago, I had already decided where I was going. But it was really an enriching experience to visit even more colleges and just know how much is out there. Um, the bottom logo is Cal State Chico, which is where I would students, more often than not, don't know what they want to do, don't know what they want to major in, don't 
don't know where they all work, so they just kind of go through life not knowing. So AVID was the program that pretty much changed all of that for me. Um, all said and done, I really thank AVID and my instructors and just everything that I've been able to do in this program very much. Thank you so much for uh, for sharing your avid experience with us. Did you guys have any questions for them? Or I know it's been a long night. <laughs> <laughs> was it worth the wait? <laughs> Questions from the board. Yeah, that we have 14 seniors in AVID this year, and we have 100% acceptance rate. Oh. And I had all the students make slides with their Bitmoji and their, uh, their uh, logos of where they were going to go, and that slideshow. Do you have any questions from the board?
Well, thank you so much for. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Uh, 2001. We How started that our, our first AVID class was uh, our first AVID freshman class, 2001, and graduated four years later. And AVID is over 40 years old and was started down in San Diego by an English teacher who saw the need for uh, crossover and support when her underprivileged students um, came up into uh, integrated high school and needed college support. And so uh, as an AP
Still on the way. So I got a call before I came here tonight, and I don't know if you guys saw the news, but uh, one of our students called me and said, oh my gosh, I was waitlisted for Santa Cruz, and we just lifted it, and I'm going to Santa Cruz. I'm from Santa Cruz, so I'm right out to spend it. And Giselle, mm -hmm. and Giselle was in Athens two years ago, and was her cousin, and they are going to be rooming together. And Giselle came back and did a Silver Scholarship, and did that because she does continue to keep in touch with our Athens family, and said, I need some extra help, how can we do that? And I think that it is dependent on the teacher, it is dependent on the networks that kids build, making sure that it's not really about me, it's about what's going on, and they all have a group chat, and we knew we got tagged for seeing the tag this morning because of that group chat, and but I think that kind of community is what really makes a difference in Catholic, and I'm not sure that that exists anywhere else in the school system, except in this program. It's like a, a school within a school within a school. Um, I agree. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. These are really my closest friends that are probably for life. So it's a really wonderful. What I, can share from, what I can share with you from the Avid Center perspective, obviously, I'm a program specialist for Avid Center. I've been working there for the last 10 years, so I want to make sure you disclose that. I've got no financial interest in the discussion we're having today. We have a district <laughs> contact, and that will not change, and the comments I'm making here will, will, bear, will have no bearing on that. But there is this focus on, um, on uh, persistence, college persistence, right? In Avid, we talk quite a bit about the difference between being prepared for college and being college ready, and I think one of the things we can hear in the in the comments that both our students at the middle school level are making it as they've developed here we're seeing high school students as well that sense of connection and that ability to hopefully thrive beyond the borders of bishop as they pursue the, the dreams they've set for themselves which are college our persistence data with avid they actually do track that with a national data service and we've got a 94 percent um, college going rate and then i think it's 84 percent persistence rate so that was that question did i, did I get it wrong by an hour yeah, we're, 89% persistence rate. So that, that question about um, are they actually staying with college, and, and that's the goal as well. Thank you so much for staying the course. Thank you so much for being uh, exerting your individual terms tonight. We appreciate you having us with us. The one thing I'll offer to the board as, as we close on Avid right there is um, we may have a more comprehensive district-wide um, presentation at a, a subsequent board meeting. But I think one of the things to understand, it, it, because of my connection to Avid, I say, take so much pleasure in hearing the success of these 17 students, these 17 seniors, 100% of them getting, a getting um, accepted to a four-year college, which they set for themselves as the goal. But I also hear that with a bit of sadness. And again, that um, whether we have one section of Avid seniors or whether we have 10 sections of Avid seniors, that does nothing for our contract with Avid. Right? I've got nothing to gain by this except for our students. The Avid student profile says that students who are underrepresented at four-year schools or have special circumstances that would prevent them from succeeding at a four-year college, that makes them eligible for AVID. And that means that any student here in Bishop can be an AVID student. Because if you go out to UCLA or UC Santa Cruz or across the country to uh, Columbia University, you are not going to see many rural students there. They will be in the vast minority and, and they will struggle with persistence. Which means that although we have 17 kids in AVID, we could have far more if they understood that this program was for them as well. So I'll offer that to the board as, as a think about and to our administration as well as a think about. Every student, according to the AVID student profile, every student in Bishop, if they chose to participate, could be eligible for the program. Item 9.2, our administration reports. We are gonna table this for this evening and we will, uh, we, we have those reports. We have those reports um, printed. If we do have follow-up questions, we'll run them through Katie, or we'll contact, um, we'll, or we'll run them through Katie. Sure. And then, if uh, if need be, then we can follow up at the next board meeting. Thank you for your own individual determination as you stay with us this evening. <laughs> and we want to make sure you get to school on time in the morning. So, uh, administrators who are giving of our admin report, thank you so much. But uh, you're excused for the evening. Item 7.0, public comment. Items of interest not addressed on the formal agenda. 
This time is set aside at each meeting for members of the audience to speak to the board regarding questions or issues not on the agenda. No action may be taken, but items may be placed on a future agenda. Please limit public comments to two minutes per speaker. We'll follow the same protocols that we did for our earlier presentations. I'll call uh, some name, uh, it looks like, I'll call three names at a time here again, ask you to come forward, and um, please uh, state your name so we know who you are, and then you have, you'll have two minutes to present. Pam Blackwell, Cindy Wenbrook, ooh, Wenbrook and Ida Atkins. Genevieve Kaligeran. Kaligeran, thank you. Emily Sims and Harold McDonald. Welcome. Uh, can you all hear in the back? Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. Let's use the mic. <laughs> Magic. Josh, Josh, I'm sorry, no, Josh. So according to the council we've received, our, our um, community members can address the board with the comments they'd like to share, but there is no board, but there is no board response. Josh, our protocols are that there are no response. There are plenty of people tonight who I would have loved to engage with, that I would have loved to talk to, but we don't. That is our protocol. We will continue to follow it. We've managed it all night long. We need to maintain that. I understand that. Josh, it is our role, Josh, it is our role and obligation to, to unbiasedly listen to our public comment. And I, am, I understand that this is difficult and challenging, but our protocols, we do not respond. We will maintain that protocol. Genevieve, I, I, appreciate, I appreciate your comments, but your two minutes are up. Thank you for sharing. Oh. Whoa. Yeah, okay. Can't go past the speaker over there. You can, just, you can just leave that on the podium. Emily. short videos that will be less than two minutes. 
talking about the proof of depopulation control. So Ms. Sims, excuse yes, me. But dis discussion and public comment are for the board to hear individual thoughts, ideas, and opinions of our community and I'll, anyone I'll else and, and anyone else who would like to uh, address the board. But it is not the time to play audio or video recordings, and this will not be allowed. You got it. Can I have my the time that you just took? To, um, I paused it. That to me. I was not aware of that. It's paused. I paused, I paused it. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Okay, um, that's all right. What I do want to address is a couple things. The transgender issue. I actually have friends that are transgender and that are gay, and I don't believe for one second that all of my friends that are actually want to have children watch them and their friends dance near naked sexually. And having our band or our students, I don't know why it went off, but having the, the uh, band in the school take part in that and having them um, attend a transgender show um, where I have been witness to these kind of shows to test it, thank you, and see what it was really like. And they have proven to be very sexually dancing and giving them ideas. And they also encourage them to bring dollar bills. I don't believe that the hate is for the transgender people. There, it is not about that. Um, and last thing I want to say is I was denied a counselor meeting with my daughter and I to meet together to discuss her and I discovering her dad and the girlfriend, who's an Inyo County Council attorney, Christian Milovich, drunk driving. When I explained that I wanted to meet with them about this and all of the issues of her health issues of the last year and my concerns about how the board has not addressed how it is proven that the government has already admit there is no transmission testing that's ever been done to stop COVID. And they know this, and you guys have not talked about this, although you've pushed everybody to get the, the, the vaccine. I know my time's up, you know what I'm talking about, you need to address it and stop okay. ignoring this and, and just listening to the who, who is the ones deciding the sexual information that you want to push on the kids. Thank you. Can I have you lift up that mic a little bit more? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Give a shout out to Abbott because I, I, I taught Abbott. I was trained in Abbott and it's absolutely a fabulous program. Um, I do have to take a moment too because one of the subjects I taught was biology. And uh, I do have to take exception to what Mr. Nicholson said about people are born either male or female because there is a, you know, XY chromosome, there's lots of combinations of those that happen. So it, it's not as clear cut. Um, but I'm not here to talk about that really. Um, though I, I've lived in Bishop, I did teach in Independence. I'm, um, my, my two children were K through 12 in Bishop, well prepared for life after high school. Uh, and, and I know we're all here because we want what's best for our children. And we'll do whatever we can to protect them. But restricting what they need is absolutely the wrong thing to do. There are many dangers in the world, cars, Sports pose real threats to students, but books do not. Books expose students to people, places, and yes, ideas that they otherwise have no access to, and that's a good thing. In a classroom setting, they can process their thoughts and feelings with their peers, with the guidance of an adult who cares deeply about them. When I think of the books that my classes explored together, nearly all of the titles that really resonated with students were challenged by groups at some point over the years. Titles that are now considered icons of literature, The Mice and Men, 1984, Lord of the Flies, the list goes on and on. All these contain ideas that are at the very least disquieting, but that is why they are powerful books. They challenge us. This is how we grow as individuals, not by being sheltered and insulated, but by stretching and reaching out to the world beyond. <laughs> Thank you for your comments. Rose Sabo, Lori McGraw, and Joyce White.
I'd like to briefly address the issue of controversial books in the classroom. When I heard political book banning efforts had finally reached Bishop, I went through Spellbinders to see if the outrage was justified. Most of the books I looked for were sold out, and the clerk said that they couldn't keep them on the shelf. I ended up putting the audiobook of Poet X by Elizabeth Acevedo on my cell phone. I'm over halfway through, and I haven't come across anything that seems worth pulling this award winner from our shelves. It's fantastic, rhythmic poetry about many of the same questions I had as a teenager. I was taught to read decades ago, and it's a skill I cherish to this day. I've read stories about people and places all over the world, about wars and love affairs, extraterrestrials and soil microbes. Not one of those books changed who I was at my core. I never attempted to become a detective or a war hero or a hobbit. Each of those books expanded my world, taught me about others, opened my eyes and my heart. Books don't change the core of a person. They enrich what's already there. I hate to see any of the books that our professionals have carefully chosen removed from their shelves. The board policy that's been in place for over a decade regarding curriculum development and instructional materials is thoughtful and has functioned well for many years. I hope you'll continue to allow the professionals in the classroom to continue doing their good work. Sincerely, Marky Marshall, Bishop. I'd also like to add personally that um, all this talk about removing books um, or talking about getting rid of various components of sex ed, um, a lot of it is about the people that we're talking about in there. And you can't erase trans and LGBTQ plus kids from the world by not talking about them in class. Those are some of our students. And when you say that they don't exist, that's damaging. And that feels like hate. And I'm sorry if you didn't mean it that way, Josh, but you can't erase my students. Yeah. Cynthia Minky, Kevin Daniels, and Tiffany Lau. Tiffany Lau, West Bishop. I'm incredibly thankful to the teacher who chose to taught, uh, teach the Poet X and to the school board meetings that brought it to my attention. I read it all the way through, and uh, judging by some of the comments I've heard at the meetings, very few people who opposed it actually read it all the way through. You will not find sex between minors, the, a scene of sex between minors in the book. What you will find is a beautiful example of two teenagers who start to have sex, and the girl realizing that she is not yet ready asking the boy to stop and him respecting her and stopping. And they are still together after that. They're still dating after that. And they have a very loving relationship after she has struggled with her body image and being objectified by other boys and even unfortunately, un and disturbingly, and it's portrayed as disturbing, objectified by men. And her, it's all about her finding her voice and through poetry and, and meaning and coming into our own. And by reducing that story to the sound bites and cherry picking the sexualized um, phrases, which are not meant to be taken in a positive light, they're like she hates them. You are doing what the antagonists in the book are doing. So I would suggest that if you're going to really object to this book, actually actually read it, actually understand what it is about. 
And Julie Deb, Lynette McIntosh, and Wayne Crosdale. Thank you, Wayne. And that I'll ask you to bring that to a close. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you, Bill. Here's a quote from the Eastern Sierra Pride website for the All Ages Drag Show on Saturday, June 3rd at 3 o'clock. You asked, and we delivered a family friendly drag show for all ages by all ages. Drag shows are a great way to be creative and empower yourself. Come laugh, dance, and sing along. Don't forget your dollar bills. Don't forget your dollar bills. What a wonderful thing to say to children. I can imagine now children throwing dollar bills at a dancer. Where else do people throw dollar bills at dancers? Oh, that's right, a strip club. What a very family friendly and creative way for children to empower themselves. Children can be creative in pure ways. They don't need to throw dollar bills at adults to do it. This is called grooming for access to pedophilia. And if we condone this behavior, we are no different from the pedophiles themselves. The dollar bills empowerment statement has since been removed from the ESP website in the All Ages Drag Show section. Why was this statement removed if there's no air in children throwing dollar bills at grown men and women dancing provocatively? One would only change something if they believed it to be an error or if they were being exposed for the true intention that was always there and they wanted to remain hidden. Here's some photos of what's going on. Wayne, could you uh, pause for just a moment, and we'll, and we'll pause your time here. This is for the school. Um, so, to it. okay, yeah, because what we need to hear are comments that are relevant to the school board, and, and, and you'll connect that to our right work. Now. Terrific. Thank right you. Now. Thank you. Here's some photos of what goes on at all age drag shows in Texas and New York. Directly on the ESP website, it says that the BUSD Color Guard will be performing at 5.30 after the drag show. This is school business now. Yeah. Do you deem this appropriate for our children? Do you deem this appropriate for school association? I'm demanding for the immediate termination of Jessica Villalobos, who went behind the superintendent's back.
back, who went behind the board of supervisors back and associated the school with this event. She took it upon herself to involve the school in this grooming event without permission or authority and must face the consequences for the sexualization of children abuse. You must take action now. This school affiliation also needs to be removed from the groomer's website as they have no operation authorization from the school to perform. And this is what you want our kids to do, to bring our dollar bills. BUSD, woo, color guard, let's go color guard. Yeah, we want to do this. Two seconds, if you condone this, you're a straight pedophile. And all you guys are pedophiles. And you can't respond to that either. Thank you for your comments. Hillary Granham, Edward Davis, and Fran Hunt. history mostly but modern history uh, repeats a lot of the same ancient traits every successful society has gatekeepers and rites of passage for youth and all of you understand this because you're professional educators so I just want to make this very clear we are not guarding the rites of passage we're pushing it on kids too young now if you if you want to do this stuff as an adult go for it Become a responsible adult and make your choices for your life, but kids are too young mm -hmm. to be choosing this type of stuff, and they should not be exposed to it. Mm -hmm. We have a million limits for kids. I mean, for crying out loud, they can't drink alcohol until they're 21. Mm -hmm. The dopamine and, and psychological hit from sexual material for children is much stronger than the substance of alcohol in their bodies. And you, biologists and science teachers, know this. Stop acting like you're unaware that this is un inappropriate for 18 and under. We need to protect our kids. Mm -hmm. Biology is one thing. Yes, let's train them all about you know, basic anatomy and their bodies. Uh, they develop them mature. And tell them the law states they have to wait for certain things. Mm -hmm. That's what responsible adults do. Thank you for your comments.
you. Thank you to all our members of the public who spoke with us tonight. We appreciate all your comments. Item 8.0, board members. This item is included to allow all board members to report out about various matters involving the district and or to request any items for future agendas. There will be no board discussion except to ask questions and no action will be taken unless listed as a subsequent agenda item. Do we have any board member um, comments? Josh, can I ask you a question before you go on? You just said that this was part of your closing argument or part of what you want to present during your board discussion of um, the continued use of the rights, respect, and responsibility of sexual health education curriculum. And it clearly states in item 8.0 that, um, that these are things for not on the current agenda items. So um, let's, uh, let's go ahead and, and just like with public comment, we had the opportunity to discuss that. Yeah, that aren't on subsequent agenda items, or that can be placed on subsequent subsequent agenda items if they need discussion. But we've already had our dis we've, we talk about on this agenda item. We we've already discussed the sex ed curriculum. Right? So. No, I'm I'm addressing what was said. Now, this will be much shorter than this. Okay.
that note, I wanted to address food safety as usual. Um, I feel like at this point, So the last meeting, Chief Tanner said he, I gave him provided phone numbers. I'm not sure if he's going to follow up or not um, with Douglas County and that volunteer program. Um, so I apologize to try to add something to the equate, Katie, but would you be willing to do that so it's just not my words, but you guys can talk to him and see? I know he did out. call and left a message, but. You already did? No, I know he did call and left a okay. message, but I'm not sure I that he's circled back yet. He's out of town today. Before, if you'd like. Let's order, please, order everybody. It's getting late, folks might be getting a little tired. Josh, you have the floor.
curious to hear what law that is. <coughs> South Dakota Trig would strongly advise that refusal to follow up county health officer orders would violate the health requirements. I would ask our health officer requirements for students or staff. Here for staff. The mayor stated district is quote unquote confident that the steps it took to enforce those orders thrust upon it were legally justified and required. <coughs> That's the case I would ask why were students treated with such disdain and a different set of rules and consequences when they chose to stand up to their rights. the library where you already said it's not safe to be in without masks. At the same time, various claims made against the district in this matter were deemed to be not legally viable, including the claim that the federal law applies only to mask necks to be manufactured. Well, Title 21 requires the option to accept or refuse administration of the product for you, I'm sorry, DUA products for motor vehicle separation class. to be offered by the district corresponds with training that is and was and already set in place by the district. It does not include any liability. So I would ask if it is and was, when and where was and was it, or will be there training? Katie, do you have answers on that one? Where and when will the training take place? The fall. The, the, same, the, the, the fall. training has been. So the yeah, there was already training, training in, I was already planning for a training in the fall. So there's already been training on implied consent? No, I'm, I'm sharing with you that I was already working on training for the fall. Okay, so you make quoting the district? What's the quote? No. The district to be offered, or the training to be offered by the district corresponds with training that is and was already set to take place and does not include any liability. So I guess it's kind of ambiguous. Um, it could be interpreted either way. But part of it sounds like there already was a training. Like it has not taken place yet. Just to clarify language, I believe what it says it is and was already planned. Yes, I'm just saying that it's ambiguous. Okay, potentially exorbitant defense costs, that's the title. In making its determination to offer a settlement, the monitor stated it should consider both the potentially exorbitant defense costs and the further disruption to the district's educational process. I just want to clarify that it did not offer this settlement. Is that correct? I'm, I'm confused on the question. So the question. statement that the district put out there saying that in making its determination to offer a settlement, the monitor stated it should consider both, quote unquote, the potentially exorbitant defense costs and the further disruption to the district's education process. Mm -hmm. So what I'm reading in that is that you're saying that SISC offered a settlement. Is well, SISC is the party that participated in the mediation. Right. I understand that, but they did not offer a settlement. That was Judge Larson, correct? Correct. Okay. I'm just making sure that it's clear that it's, this is false because. Well, the judge sets the terms. Right. So he's making it sound like SISC made an offer for the settlement and that's not true. I wasn't present for the mediation. No, I understand that. Well, I mean, if, if they made an offer, then there would have been no point to mediation. I think for clarity, the, the judge offered terms to both parties. Okay. Well, certainly perhaps the judge proposed terms. The point of that is this statement right. is not true. I think in order for us to get verification of that, we would have to speak to uh, Mr. DiMario, right? The parties who are present. There's nobody in this room who is present to that. Okay, I understand that. And I've asked, I've asked for it uh, through email or was speaking with Katie and I don't know if it exists, but in the uh, area of litigation, there's usually an opinion or a brief. And does that not exist, Katie, from Judge Larson? No. Can there be one? I can talk to Mr. DiMario.
there any other um, comments or issues the board would like to discuss? So that, um, it says there will be no board discussion except to ask questions. That is a question, right? We appreciate that, but it's not one we can answer right now because no action will be taken. We're talking about subsequent agendas. Right. Can we so put that link, I'll ask, can we put that on the subsequent agenda? That is something that Katie can, can uh, facilitate again and, and, and uh, bring, us, bring us to that question. I will not engage in discussion, but one of the things I would like to share during item 8.0 is my perspective on the settlement. I appreciate your individual perspective, Josh. I do. The board position was unequivocal. All claims were denied. There was no, in this settlement, there was no cost to the district. There was no admission of liability and any actions that are gonna be taken as listed in that settlement were already planned and are not a result of that settlement but simply included in it. Item 8.1, next regular board meeting. This item is not a discussion item. We can have it on subsequent, I, clearly. Okay. There's open. been no further payments due to any no, I mean, this activity. We, we obviously, this was our intent. You, right. We pay a premium to you. Every year? Yeah. Yeah. Annually. Mm -hmm. So when, when you, you say that the district has, did not pay this. If perhaps I was unclear, let me clarify. Directly. Yeah, That's if, if we perhaps. Didn't pay, we didn't make payments directly to anybody, yeah. but through SIS, it's still taxpayer dollars that we've wasted. We pay, uh, we pay a premium for our insurance every year. Every school does, it's what we do. Right. The amount set forth in this, in this settlement is unrelated to that payment. We, um, we engage their services in an insurance company. The insurance company has settled with these claimants. They are the ones who are going to bear the cost of that. There is no cost, no additional cost of this settlement to the district. So it's just mind boggling that there is zero responsibility, zero accountability taken by this board. None. It's, it's, it's. I'll, I'll repeat what I said, Josh, and then we're going to. I would, you, you have an opportunity. I, I hear what you're saying. We are not going to engage in discussions. I'll repeat what I said, and then we will close. The position of the board in this matter was unequivocal. If you open up our voting record, you will see that all claims were denied. Item 8.1, next regular board meeting, that. Tuesday, June 13th, 2023, at 6.30 p.m. In person will be held in the Carl Lynn boardroom and via Zoom webinar teleconference. Item 8.2, next special board meeting, Thursday, June 15th, 2023, at 6.30 p.m. In person will be held in the Carl Lynn boardroom via Zoom and webinar conference. We'll move on to item 9.0, reports and presentations. Item 9.3, Katie Kolker, UHS Superintendent. summer school um, it will be 16 days across all sites the same days this year um, TK all the way through 12th grade we'll have extended school year at both Bishop Elementary and Bishop High uh, we do have various enrichment offered this summer so that includes the Sierra Adventure Camp for our incoming sixth through eighth graders um, there'll be one week for boys one week for girls there's a suggested donation but no students would be turned away from this opportunity so hopefully it's full this will be our first year offering um, our after school program, Ram Club Summer Camps. So um, Brittany's done a great job setting these up ahead of time. We'll be able to serve up to 50 kids in each camp for each week. So there's a challenger sports soccer camp, an art camp and adventure camp. And then in August, uh, a week with Playhouse 395 and then an Eastern Sierra Adventure Camp. So a lot of kids should be able to benefit from this. It's for TK through five and like I said, we haven't done anything like this before, so it's a pretty exciting opportunity. Uh, quick note on enrollment. As we've said in the past um, few months, enrollment has been steady. Um, we're likely to see a bit of a bump next year because we'll continue to offer um, the TK expansion. 
And so that's the timeline there. We project uh, about 53 TK students. So we'll stay with the three classes next school year. And then the year after that, we'll likely move to four and after that to five. I have been in conversation with Esmeralda Cal County. Um, the students in Fish Lake Valley are interested in attending Bishop High next year. We're about 85 miles away, which is a ridiculous amount of time. Okay. But then when I asked them about this, they said we already drive 75 miles um, to Pahrump. Wow. So it's really not that much further, which is mind boggling. So the day for these kids is just extremely long already. And to boot, Pahrump is having a really difficult time staffing. And so many of these kids go to school each day with virtual teachers. Um, rather than actual in-person instruction. Um, so they're lacking a lot of the um, offerings that we have here at Bishop. It might be about 15 students. And so um, we need to get some of these details ironed out. Uh, Esmeralda County has already said that they would take care of the transportation. So busing to and from. Uh, we need to look into what services um, these students would need to make sure that we could meet their needs. Uh, they're very interested in participating in extracurriculars, but um, we have to figure out when teams travel and uh, where the kids might stay, if they need to go out of town or there's a late game, um, what the commute might look like. And then um, funding. So uh, I have a call into legal about this. Um, it's a little gray as to um, inter-district, interstate transfers. Right. And so <laughs> this isn't very common, as you can imagine. Um, so there are some precedents in other states, but um, for California specifically is what we're looking into to make sure that we would receive the funding for these kids um, or if we needed to contract to get additional funding from Fish Lake Valley for them. So more information on that. We would like to finalize this this summer so that these families can know one way or the other if this would be an opportunity for them. Um, mm -hmm. I know... Um, specifically in your county, uh, in uh, the southern end of the county, Death Valley. Mm -hmm. There's a number of students that either go or used to go to Beatty mm -hmm. for school. So it's California to Nevada um, for most of those Death Valley students. Yes. So it's the other way that Exactly. Right. Never mind. Right. Yep. Moving on. Yep. And then question on that, would we sign some sort of a memorandum of understanding with them? How would that mm -hmm. happen? So that would come to your approval okay. once it's in place. Uh, that superintendent is already looking at samples for this. Right. Right. Uh, so far, the only samples he has are from other states. Right. <laughs> so uh, we need to find one that's California specific. So hopefully more on that by next month. And then a very quick FEMA update. We've had our recovery scoping meeting uh, that took a long time. We went through three different project managers and finally third time was a charm. So uh, we met about a week ago we have submitted um, pu public assistance project requests for roof repairs on eight roofs, a propane gas line replacement, and um, building replacements at our elementary school um, because of the methane issues. So we will likely be working with a soil engineer to come on site and determine um, the levels of methane and how we might mitigate that with existing systems or if we would qualify for new buildings altogether. I asked just point blank, will we have more information by August? And it doesn't look likely. So we will probably need to move forward with some of these projects regardless of um, whether or not FEMA is going to be involved or at least up, up front the costs and hopefully later on get reimbursed um, as we move forward. But it will be lengthy. Any questions for Superintendent Coker? Thank you for your presentation. Item 10.0, the consent agenda. Items included on the consent agenda may be approved by a single vote of the board. Any items which warrant further discussion may be separated for discussion and or approval. Do I have a motion to discuss and or approve item 10.0? I think we approve item 10.0. Thank you, and do I have a second? I'll second. Virginia, we're second on that one. Any discussion? I would just ask um, a couple things. 10.1, um, I would like to add to the minutes from the school safety. And I was just referring again to the Douglas County School District Volunteer Program. Sure. Sure. And then I think 10.6 and 10.1 need further discussion. Um, 
So if there are additional questions on that, I'd ask that we table it when um, Gretchen is here to help field some of those questions. You know, before before we do that, we would need a motion to remove those. Do I have to have a motion? I'll make a motion to table 10.6 and 10.10 for further discussion. And do I have a second? Motion does not move forward, so we'll move forward with um, approving the agenda, the 10.0 consent agenda as is. Um, with the uh, addendum that 10.1, the minutes will be amended to reflect comment on Douglas County. Okay. All in favor of approval of item 10.0. Can I make one little comment? Uh, right now, I'm sorry, we're, we're in the middle of our, our board, uh, our votes. I appreciate it, thank you. And I appreciate your understanding. All in favor of approval of item 10.0. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. And uh, so it's 4-1 with no abstentions. Item 11.0, discussion and approval items. 11.1, discussion approval, form J13A, request for allowance of attendance due to emergency conditions. And there's an enclosure with that. Do I have a motion to discuss and or approve item 11.1? I move we discuss item 11. .1. Thank you. And do I have a second? A second. That was Kathy. Any discussion? Katie, can you provide a little background on that one? Sure, this is just an expansion of what you approved a couple of months ago to reflect all the days that school needed to be closed during the winter storms. As we did in the past for the winter storm before? Yes, I brought it to you a couple of months ago um, with the January closures, and this now reflects the February and March ones. Perfect, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other board member comments or discussion? All in favor of approval of item 11.1? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Item carries 5-0. Item 11.2, discussion and approval, the revised new policies, regulations, exhibits, and bylaws, 2022-2023. There's an enclosure available at the district office. This is our second reading. Do I have a motion to approve item 11.2? I move to approve item thank you. 11.2. Thank you. And do we have a second? Thank you, Kathy, Virginia, and then Kathy. Any discussion? All in favor of approval 11.2? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Item carries 4-1. That brings us to the end of our open session right there. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for staying the course. And um, we appreciate all of your uh, participation in the democratic process that we're engaged in. We will be reporting out after closed session. You're most welcome.